morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Welcome to the day two of SBIA workshop on use of biomarkers for diagnosing and assessing treatment response in non serotic NASH trials. My name is Insuk Kim. I am a master scientist in the Office of Clinical Pharmacology at FDA, supporting the development and evaluation of drug product for liver diseases, including NASH. This is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the second day of this important workshop to continue discussing use of biomarkers for non serotic NASH trials. As disclaimer, views expressed in this presentation are my own and do not necessarily represent an official FDA position. I have no financial interest to disclose. First, I'd like to thank CEDAR Small Business and Industry Assistance Team and all speakers and panelists to make this important workshop possible. And most of all, I'd like to thank you for being here to move this field forward with us. To briefly recap the day one, we had great discussion on biomarkers in general, different types of biomarkers, and how FDA views reasonably likely surrogate endpoint. My colleague, Dr. Markar, presented the accelerated approval pathway for drugs for NASH using histology-based reasonably likely surrogate endpoint. Dr. Krudis shared an example of how PET scan was accepted in Alzheimer's disease as a surrogate endpoint for approval of drugs under accelerated approval pathway. On the other hand, Dr. Chang shared a cautionary tale about recent re regulatory experiences with accelerated approval of Makina for prevention of preterm delivery and the failure of the drug to demonstrate clinical benefit preterm infant survivor in the confirmatory trial. While the histology-based surrogate endpoints are currently recommended for NASH trials to support accelerated approval, there are inherent challenges with histology-based endpoint. With emerging technologies, the promise and challenges of applying new techniques such as machine learning, artificial intelligence to interpret histopathology were also discussed. Stakeholders shared their viewpoints on the histology-based endpoint and discussed uncertainty associated with the current surrogate endpoint in predicting clinical benefit, how patient feel, function, survive, and the importance of the clinical trial that confirms the clinical benefit of a drug once product approved via accelerated approval pathway. Ten years ago, in September 2013, FDA with the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease, AASLD, jointly held a workshop to discuss clinical trial designs and endpoints for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, NAFLD, on F FDA White Oak campus. Since the workshop in 2013, clinical investigation for NASH product development significantly increased as shown by the increasing number of new investigational drug applications up submitted to FDA. FDA published the draft guidance for industry for developing drugs for non serotic NASH with fibrosis in 2018 and for NASH with compensated cirrhosis in 2019. To further assist the drug development for treatment of NASH, FDA convened a workshop to discuss leveraging clinical pharmacology principle to optimize drug development for NASH in 2019, and also held a webcast to discuss the clinical development program for NASH in 2021. In the last 10 years, through the promising discovery and clinical trials, including failed ones, the science has vastly advanced in this field. There has been burgeoning of development of non-invasive tests for assessment of liver fibrosis as well. Fast forward, exactly 10 years after a joint workshop, we are here to discuss future of the NASH trials and clinical practice for patients with NASH, in particular, the utility of emerging biomarkers for diagnosis and assessment of treatment response for NASH. Qualified biomarkers are vital for success of drug development via 
confidence in drugs, mechanism of action, patient selection, dose selection, as well as assessment of safety and efficacy. In NASH trials, various biomarkers have been used for efficacy and safety assessment throughout drug development programs, including phase one and phase two trials. Today, we are going to hear about the currently available data on the performance of imaging biomarkers and circulating biomarkers for diagnosing and assessing treatment response in non-steroidic NASH trials. Considerations for development of non-invasive biomarkers for clinical trials and clinical practice that can accurately and reliably assess presence, staging, grading, and progression of disease will be also discussed. First, my colleague, Dr. Rebecca Hager, will talk about biomarkers and surrogate endpoint in the regulatory framework. Dr. Hager is the lead mathematical statistician of the Office of Biostatistics at FDA, supporting the development and evaluation of drug product for liver disease. Thank you. Dr. Hager? Thank you. Hello. My name is Rebecca Hager, and I am a statistical team leader at FDA supporting the Division of Hepatology and Nutrition. My presentation will recap definitions and the regulatory framework that was presented in session one yesterday in order to set the stage for the presentations today. First, we will go over definitions of different types of outcomes and endpoints. A clinical outcome is an outcome that describes or reflects how an individual feels, functions, or survives. A clinical benefit is a positive therapeutic effect on this outcome that is clinically meaningful. A biomarker is a defined characteristic that is objectively measured as an indicator of normal biological processes, pathological processes, or responses to an exposure or intervention which includes therapeutic interventions. There are a range of different biomarker types, some of which measure disease presence and status, and some of which measure aspects of response to treatment. A surrogate endpoint is a marker that is thought to predict clinical benefit, but is not itself a measure of clinical benefit. A validated surrogate endpoint has been shown to predict a specific clinical benefit and can be used to support traditional approval. Validated endpoints, surrogate endpoints, have strong and diverse evidence supporting the relationship of the biomarker and the clinical outcome. A surrogate endpoint that is reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit has not reached the level of evidence needed to validate it. Sometimes this is referred to as a reasonably likely surrogate endpoint. This type of endpoint can be used to support accelerated approval. Reasonably likely surrogate endpoints are supported by strong mechanistic and or epidemiological rationale. Currently, there are no validated surrogate endpoints for NASH. The reasonably likely surrogate endpoints that are currently accepted by FDA in the patient population with non serotic NASH include improvement of fibrosis and no worsening of steatohepatitis, or resolution of steatohepatitis and no worsening of fibrosis, or both improvement of fibrosis and resolution of steatohepatitis. Details of the definitions of these endpoints are in the guidance for industry, non serotic non-alcoholic steatohepatitis with liver fibrosis, developing drugs for treatment. Clinical outcomes that may be evaluated in a composite clinical benefit endpoint include progression to cirrhosis on histopathology, hepatic decompensation events, change in MELD that approximates listing for liver transplant, liver transplant, and all-cause mortality. Next, I will go over different regulatory approval pathways. A traditional approval is based on a measurement of clinical benefit or an effect on a validated surrogate endpoint. An accelerated approval is based on a drug's effect on a surrogate or intermediate clinical endpoint that is reasonably likely to predict a drug's clinical benefit. Drugs granted accelerated approval 
must meet the same statutory standards for safety and effectiveness as those granted traditional approval. Accelerated approval can provide patients with serious and life-threatening diseases access to new therapy sooner for conditions for which there is an unmet need for treatment. Because accelerated approval is based on the drug's effect on a surrogate or intermediate clinical endpoint, this accepts some additional uncertainty as a trade-off in providing earlier access to treatment. As a condition of the accelerated approval, FDA has required post-approval studies to verify and describe the drug's clinical benefit. To summarize, a traditional approval can be supported by a validated surrogate endpoint or a clinical endpoint, which directly measures how a patient feels, functions, or survives. An accelerated approval can be supported by a reasonably likely surrogate endpoint. As there is less certainty that the observed treatment effect on the surrogate endpoint will translate into clinical benefit, post-approval verification of clinical benefit is required. Thank you all for attending this workshop. I am looking forward to the upcoming sessions today on imaging and circulating biomarkers, discussion about the current levels of evidence for these biomarkers, and the potential for future advancements. Thank you. Hi. My name is Abbas Bandekwala, and I'm in the CEDAR Biomarker Qualification Program. And I will be moderating this session with my colleague, Dr. Dan Daniel Kraniak. I will begin this session by introducing the speakers who will be presenting data on the imaging biomarkers being developed in the NASH clinical trial space. The first speaker today will be Dr. Phil Newsom, professor of hepatology and honorary consultant hepatologist from University of Birmingham. Dr. Newsom is also the Director of Research and Knowledge Transfer at the College of Medical and Dental Science at University of Birmingham, Director of Birmingham NIHR Medical Research Center, and Director of Midland and Wales Advanced Therapy Treatment Center. Dr. Newsom will be presenting information and data on ultrasound-based liver stiffness. Following Dr. Newsom will be Dr. Sutherland. Dr. Sullivan is a professor of radiology at University of California, San Diego. Dr. Sullivan directs the University of California, San Diego Health, Health Liver Imaging Group, which seeks to advance screening, diagnosis, treatment, and outcomes of individuals with liver disease. He, he is academic co-chair of the imaging work stream for the foundation of the NIH or FNIH Non-Invasive Biomarker for Metabolic Liver Disease, also known as NIMBLE project and he is the found, founder of the Liver Imaging Reporting and Data System, which is now used worldwide for radiological imaging of liver cancer. Dr. Sutherland will provide a presentation on using magnetic resonance elastography in NASH clinical trials. Finally, Dr. Scott Reeder is a professor at the University of Wisconsin. He is a H.A. Rome's faculty fellow, vice, vice chair of research and chief of MRI as well as the former director of the University of Wisconsin Clinical MRI Fellowship. He is also the former associate director of the Medical Scientist Training Program in the School of Medicine and Public Health. Dr. Reeder will present information and data on corrected T1 and PDFF MR imaging. Let's now hear from Dr. Newsom. Okay, thank you very much. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you very much for the invitation to join this really exciting two-day webinar. So here is the title of my talk. Next slide, please. Um, so you've skipped over my disclosure slide. Um, I've got a number of disclosures which are, are indicated in the slide deck I forwarded in, uh, all on behalf of the University of Birmingham. So on this slide, I'd like to make, uh, firstly, as Jeffrey outlined yesterday, there are multiple contexts of use of biomarkers, and I'd like to focus uh, on four of those as indicated in the slide here, namely diagnosis, prognosis, monitoring. The second point I'd like to make is that the evidence required will clearly vary for each of the categories. And as we all recognize, in many cases, the reference is the reference standard is the liver biopsy, which is a challenge for the reasons that have been touched on and which we'll discuss later on. So clearly, ultimately, it then is around how we can establish whatever biomarker it is, in this case, ultrasound-based elastography, as a surrogate endpoint, which has detail there is really around it having a clear mechanistic rationale 
and also clinical data that provides strong evidence that that change in that surrogate endpoint will predict a specific clinical benefit. Next slide, please. So as you can see on this slide, there are two, two major ways in which ultrasound-based elastography can be undertaken. Um, in essence, elastography measures the speed of a given shear wave across the liver from which a liver stiffness measurement can be derived. And that gives us a sort of a, a gauge for the degree of liver fibrosis. And what this slide indicates are the key differences here in terms of how the shear wave is generated, how the frequency within it is controlled, and also the choice of measurement depth. One of them sits, that is the one on the left, sits on general devices, whereas the other sits within a dedicated device. Um, as the vast majority of the data generated really come from the one on the right, namely vibration control trends and elastography, that is the technology that we'll focus on for the rest of this particular talk. Next slide, please. This is a systematic review and meta-analysis that was I conducted with a number of colleagues, many of whom are part of the webinar, which looks to correlate or looks to, to see what the association is between fibrosis stage and clinical outcomes. So there's three broad points I'd like to make in this slide. The first is that, um, as you can see on the left, um, once you get fibrosis stage two and above, there is a strong association with increased all-cause mortality. The second point, if you look to the bar chart on the right, is that you can see that the, the rate of liver-related mortality is substantially lower than the overall all-cause mortality, which you know, resonates with data that the late Paul Angelo published. The other related point there is that actually it's only when you start to look at patients with F3 fibrosis and above that there's a statistically increased risk of liver mortality. Next slide, please. And what you can see here on the bottom, however, is that um, patients with F2 fibrosis, whilst they may not have an increase in liver-related mortality, they do have an increased risk of liver events. So I think these data set the scene for how we think about the context of use use um, for vibration uh, VTCE. Next slide, please. So here are some of the, the, the data which I think inform our views. This was a large prospective study of 450 patients who underwent a liver biopsy within two weeks of having their fibre scan. I should say that all the patients were in secondary care liver centers anyway, so there's a form of uh, referral bias there. And the aim was to look at the controlled attenuation parameter, so modality that looked at steatosis, and also the liver stiffness measurement. And in particular, their diagnostic performance against histology. And as you can see here, the relevant um, AUC data are shown um, on the right. So a couple of points to make. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. So this, this um, slide here summarizes um, the data from the previous study I've touched on, and also another one, another large study from the NASH CRM. So I think the, point, the points to make here are that, firstly, the performance is um, good to excellent and is pretty similar between um, the UK and also um, the US experience. I think, as you can see, there are some challenges, and that this was highlighted yesterday, distinguishing between sort of interim, so F2 and F3 grades of fibrosis whereas it's clearly much more effective at distinguishing people at the more extreme ends. And particularly, you can see it's very good at ruling out liver cirrhosis, as highlighted in the, um, the box. Next slide, please. So when considering this modality, I'd like you to think about cutoffs slightly differently. Um, the previous slide really touched on what's the more conventional route, which is looking at the UDON cutoff, where you optimize the cutoff for sensitivity and specificity. But I think what, what we tried to do here, and in the same with the NASH CRN study, is to think about setting cutoffs, which do you know, have two cutoffs, one which kind of rules out patients, in this case, those with advanced fibrosis. Um, and you can do that by, um, if you go to the next slide, if you do that here by setting the value which achieves 90% sensitivity, you can see that it's very useful at identifying a threshold below which you can eliminate patients as having that condition. And next slide, this is the, the corollary, which is looking at a high specificity. So looking to identify those individuals who are very likely to have a condition. 
So I think the point here is, is that if you, if you take this approach rather than a single approach, you know, you're able to, to use the test more effectively to reassure those patients based in, in primary care, say, and also um, you know, take a much more confirmatory view on those patients with advanced fibrosis. Next slide, please. So one of the key points here is understanding the setting within which a particular biomarker such as VCT is looked at. And I think the critical point here is understanding the importance of prevalence and the pretest probability when you are making sense of the, um, the particular biomarker. So what you can see here is that if we start with the rule out cutoff, the negative predictive value, this is in the top, in the, right, in the red triangle at the top, the negative predictive value is 72%. And as the prevalence drops, as the condition becomes less common, the negative predictive value markedly increases. So as a, as, a, as, a, as a test to rule out, it becomes ever more useful. However, the corollary applies when you start to look at specificity, so the use of the test to identify patients. And what you can see here is that the prevalence, as the prevalence drops from the prevalence in the study population down to what it might be in the general population, the positive predictive value starts to drop quite remarkably. And therefore, you know, one needs to be cognizant of that when making decisions. Next slide, please. So one thing that I found useful, which again can be applied for many different biomarkers, is the use of Fagan's nomogram, which was published a number of years ago in the New England. And what this really does is it provides a useful way of linking the prevalence of a condition with the known positive or negative likelihood ratio so that you can calculate the post-test probability. So I'd like to illustrate two scenarios here. Um, in this first case scenario here, you've got a patient who's got, um, the question is around identifying significant fibrosis as determined by F2 or above in the secondary care setting. And you've got a readout there, a liver stiffness measurement of eight and a half kilopascals. And we know from the studies that the positive likelihood ratio is 2.3. So the question here is, what is the post-test probability? And if you go to the next slide, please, you can see that the answer is 80%. So you're really, you know, you're, you're bumping up um, the, the, the likely post-test probability to a level where you've got a great deal of confidence that, that individual has what you're interested in, in this case, F2 and above fibrosis. Next slide, please. So this is um, the opposite approach. This is where you're trying to um, see whether an individual does or does not have cirrhosis. So again, it's in a secondary care clinic, the prevalence, which we know is about 9%, and the reading is 12 kilopascals. We know that the negative likelihood ratio is 0 0.19. And if we go to the next slide, please, you can see that if you plot that line from the pretest probability through the likelihood ratio in the middle, you end up with an answer of 1%. So you take an individual who you can significantly reassure that they do not have liver cirrhosis on the basis of the, the BCT here, and you're understanding your pretest probability. Next slide, please. So previously, I talked around liver stiffness measurement and fibrosis. What this slide does is it describes how the combination of liver stiffness measurement, controlled attenuation parameter, and AST can start to provide information not just on fibrosis, but around the presence of at-risk NASH. And by at-risk NASH, I mean NASH as evidenced um, histologically, uh, NAS activity score of four and above, and also F2 fibrosis and above. So this was, again, a prospective study that was part of the, the previous study I mentioned. But then, as you can see, there have been a number um, of subsequent studies and a recent systematic review and meta-analysis um, of just under 6,000 patients, again, provides cutoffs to rule out and rule in. And again, you can see the likelihood ratios, which I think are really, really important um, parameters which we need to understand when we're looking at biomarkers, which, you know, again, demonstrate a sort of good negative and positive likelihood ratio. And as you can see, this, um, a bit like um, VCT, is under consideration um, for, for a qualification as a diagnostic enrichment drug development tool. And that this one is being proposed by Lemus. So next slide, please. So we focused on diagnosis. Um, in the remainder of the talk, I'd like to touch on the use of this biomarker in different contexts of use. In this case here, treatment response. So this, uh, these data come from the STEMA-NAS trial, which was the daily semaglutide trial published in the New England Journal. And what it looks at here is the change in liver stiffness measurement 
um, in the different groups. And what you can see is a very clear association with use of semaglutide, which is dose dependent. So you can see there that the, the liver stiffness measurements reduce in the active arms and go up, um, or certainly don't reduce in the placebo arm. Next slide, please. And similarly, if you look at the Regenerate study with obidicolic acid, the uh, publication published by Mara Ranella, uh, what this demonstrates is that if you look at patients with histological worsening of fibrosis, they had increases in their liver stiffness measurement, whether they were on placebo or obidicolic acid. And similarly, those with improvements in fibrosis had reductions in liver stiffness measurement. Next slide, please. So what we can see is that for, for many of the drug studies, there's a, a, a nice correlation between you know, the overall groups that improve and those um, that see a commensurate improvement with, um, with their liver stiffness measurement. One of the challenges I guess we need to explore is at the individual patient level, you know, does that sort of link you know, remain? In other words, although the group may improve histologically and with the liver stiffness measurement, you know, to what extent does that occur at a patient by patient level and are there variances there? Okay, next slide, please. So now I'd like to look at prognosis and there are several studies here, really just really giving you a feel for the, the critical mass of data. And the key point here is that all of these studies show the same thing, namely that the higher the liver stiffness measurement value at baseline, the higher the risk of progression to cirrhosis the liver-related clinical events, and the death. And if you look at it, the data in the round, it would appear that about 16 to 20, 20 kilopascals appears to be the range above which that there starts to be a major change in the likelihood of developing hard clinical endpoints. And indeed, you know, this cutoff has been incorporated in the Bovino criteria for making decisions around when patients with cirrhosis should undergo variceal surveillance. Next slide, please. So the final context of use that I'd like to touch on is monitoring. And this is a nice study by Petter and at on the left. And this demonstrates that a 20% reduction in liver stiffness measurement is associated with a much lower risk of developing liver-related events and death compared to those individuals in which there was no major change and also compared to those individuals in the dark blue bar in which there was a 20% increase in LSM. On the right, um, there's a nice study by Gori et al, uh, which was presented at the liver meeting. And again, what that demonstrates is that if you go from a rise, as if your liver stiffness measurement rises from 12.1 kilo, from below 12.1 kilopascals to above 14.9, again, as you can see from the curves, there's a significantly greater risk of developing liver-related complications. Next slide, please. So there's a missing slide here, unfortunately, which I can update in the deck, which really provides a summary of all the main papers that I've touched on and some more, just to really give you a sense for the critical mass of the underpinning literature, which has developed over the last probably 10 to 15 years around VCT. So in summary, therefore, uh, I've hopefully highlighted the data for liver stiffness measurement, specifically VCTE, in the four main contexts of use, namely diagnosis, response, prognosis, and monitoring. And hopefully this gives us food for thought as we come into the discussions at the end of the session. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, Dr. Newsom, thank you so much. That was an excellent lecture. Uh, my name is Claude Serlin. I'm a radiologist at UC San Diego, and I, I will be speaking on MR elastography and the use of clinical trials. Is MRE ready for prime time? Next slide. And here are my disclosures. Next slide. So in this talk, I'll be presenting some facts, which represent the facts as I understand them to the best of my knowledge. I'll also be occasionally presenting some opinions, and those are in the best of my judgment. I do apologize for the darkness of my room. It's uh, 6.29 in the morning and the sun has not quite risen. So uh, next slide. Uh, MR elastography is a non-invasive uh, imaging method of assessing mechanical properties as shown on this slide. 
Notice that there are several mechanical properties that can be measured. Next slide. But in this uh, lecture, I will focus only on one of those mechanical properties, stiffness. Next slide, please. Now, um, MR elastography comes in two major flavors. There's 2D MR elastography, which is the current clinical uh, modality, and there's 3D MRE, which represents the emerging state of the art. But since 2D MRE is the established clinical modality, I will focus today on 2D MRE. Next slide. And next slide. Now, as we learned uh, yesterday, the FDA defines seven biomarker categories as illustrated uh, on this slide. I don't have time to talk about the evidence of MRE for all seven diagnostic categories. I will focus on two. Next slide. In particular, I will be focusing on diagnostic enrichment and treatment response assessment. And for each one of those um, uh, categories, I will be asking the question, is MRE ready for prime time? Next slide. So let's start with diagnostic enrichment and break it down into three subcategories. Diagnostic enrichment for the detection of patients who have F greater than or equal to two. Uh, detection of patients who have at-risk NASH, which is defined as the presence of NASH in combination with a non-NAFLD activity score greater than or equal to four as well as a fibrosis stage of greater than or equal to two. And finally, non-serotic at-risk NASH, which is the same as at-risk NASH after exclusion of patients with fibrosis. So it refers specifically to patients with stage two or stage three fibrosis. Let's start with the evidence for MRE to detect fibrosis greater than or equal to two. Next slide. And next slide. So since 2011, there have been at least 26 published studies that have looked at the diagnostic performance of 2D MR elastography for detection of fibrosis greater than or equal to two. Next slide. Now I don't have time to go over all 26 studies, so instead I'll focus in on the most recent meta-analysis published just recently by Liang and colleagues. Next slide. This meta-analysis was an individual patient meta-analysis in which data was compiled from 798 patients from eight international cohorts. As you can see on the global map at the bottom left, four of these cohorts uh, came from North America, two came from Europe, and two came from Asia. Next slide. And here is what the meta-analysis uh, showed. Uh, on the upper row, you can see the various uh, different individual sites that contributed uh, data, uh, 798 patients in the meta-analysis. Next slide. In the meta-analysis, the prevalence of fibrosis greater than or equal to two was 39%. On your right, you can see the prevalences at each of the individual sites that contributed patients. Next slide. At the meta-analytic level, the pooled AUC was 0.92, and you can see the AUC ranges for the individual sites on the right. Next slide. In the meta-analysis, uh, the UDIN cutoff was 3.14 kilopascals, and that cutoff, next slide, provided sensitivities of 79 and 89%. And you can see the ranges of the individual uh, parameters at the individual sites. Next slide. These authors also uh, defined a cutoff uh, for ruling out uh, fibrosis greater than or equal to two, which they defined as the cutoff that provides a sensitivity of at least 90%. That cutoff was 2.5 kilopascals and provided a specificity of 60% with 90% sensitivity. And they also, next slide, uh, looked at a rule-in cutoff, which they defined as a specificity of 90% of great or greater. That cutoff was 3.30 kilopascals, and that provided a sensitivity of 72% uh, with a specificity of 90%. So as you can see, the performance of MRE for the detection of fibrosis greater than or equal to two was really quite good uh, in this meta-analysis. Next slide. 
Now, this is an important slide. Uh, the authors also did sub-analyses for the performance of MRE, breaking it down according to different uh, potential biological and other confounders. Notice, next slide, that the presence or absence of NASH did have a statistically significant effect on the performance the AUC was higher in patients who did not have NASH than in patients who did have NASH. But although it was statistically significant, I would argue that it's not so clinically meaningful, the difference between 0.93 and 0.87. Next slide. Notice, however, that for all of these other potential biological confounders, sex, geographic region, BMI, presence or absence of steatosis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, there were no significant pairwise differences for other potential confounders, which really, I think, speaks to the robustness of MRE for the detection of fibrosis greater than or equal to two. Next slide. So now let's uh, shift and look at the evidence for the ability of MRE to detect at-risk NASH, which again is defined as the presence of NASH with an NA score greater than or equal to four and with fibrosis at least equal to two. Next slide. Now, unlike the previous uh, endpoint in which we had 26 published studies, here I was able to find three studies, two of which have been published, Imago 2021 and LEAD 2023. And then I'd like to present some emerging data from an R01 that I have uh, with Scott Reeder. Uh, this uh, last uh, data is not yet published. Next slide. So here are the data from the three studies. Uh, the AUC of uh, MRE for detection of at-risk NASH ranges from 0.66 for Imago to 0.89 for Lee. And in the emerging data that Scott and I have for our R01, uh, we are getting an AUC of 0.84. Uh, the 95% confidence intervals are shown below. Next slide. Um, for the Lee paper, uh, the UDIN index had a cutoff of 3.3 kilopascals with excellent sensitivity and specificity. Next slide. And notice that we in our emerging R01 are finding a similar cutoff of 3.4 kilopascals with slightly lower sensitivity, but slightly higher specificity. Next slide. Uh, the Imago paper did not provide data on cutoffs. Uh, next slide. Okay, now let's look at non serotic at risk NASH. Are there any papers looking at MRE for the detection of this particular uh, endpoint? Uh, next slide. And the answer is no. There have been no published studies that have directly addressed this context of use using pre specified cutoffs to exclude uh, cirrhosis. Next slide. Okay, so in summary, is MRE ready for prime time for diagnostic enrichment? Next slide. And here is my opinion. So is MRE um, ready for prime time? Next slide. So 26 studies have looked at the performance for fibrosis greater than or equal to two. The performance is excellent. I would argue that yes, MRE is ready for prime time. It needs qualification and we are hopeful that Nimble will provide that qualification. Next slide. At-risk NASH, only three studies, but the data is fairly compelling. So I would say that probably MRE is ready for prime time for this particular uh, detection. And we plan to uh, qualify uh, MRE for this purpose in Nimble. Finally, next slide. For non serotic NASH, zero studies, but very plausible that MRE could be used to uh, exclude cirrhosis while ruling F2 or F3. We need data. We will get that data, we hope, in Nimble. Next slide. Okay, what about MRE combined with other biomarkers? Either, uh, well, next slide. So for fibrosis greater than or equal to two, next slide. So there have been five studies that have looked at the accuracy of 2D MRE when combined with other biomarkers for detection of F greater than or equal to two, as shown on this slide. Notice that depending on the paper, MRE might be combined with FIB4 or AST or ALT or some combination of proton density fat fraction and AST. Next slide. 
Um, I'll focus on only one of these papers because it provided a head-to-head -head comparison performance of MRE in combination with FIB4 versus MRE in combination with proton density fat fraction and AST. MRE plus FIB4 is known as MIFIB. MRE plus PDFF plus AST is known as MAST. Next slide. So in this particular paper, MRE plus FIB4 or MIFIB had an AUC of 0.9, which was higher than the AUC of MAST, which is MRE and PDFF and AST. So based on a single paper, more data is needed. It may be that MIFIB is more accurate than MAST, but as I said, more data is needed. And this is for fibrosis greater than equal to two. Next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm sorry, next slide, please. And next slide. And next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, now let's look at uh, 2D MRE in combination with other biomarkers for at-risk NASH uh, defined as I've already defined. Uh, next slide, please. So four studies have assessed the accuracy for MRE in combination with other biomarkers for detecting at-risk NASH. Three of the studies have been published in the last couple of years. I'm also presenting one study that is not yet published. This is emerging data uh, from the R01 that Scott Reeder and I have uh, together. Uh, next slide. And uh, what I'm showing here is uh, different rows that look at either MRE alone, which are the top two rows, or MRE in combination with various other either imaging or circulating biomarkers, which are the rows immediately below. Next slide. So notice that the AUC of MRE alone is between 0.81 and 0.89 uh, for the diagnosis of at-risk NASH. Next slide. And shown here are the performances of MRE in combination with other imaging and circulating uh, biomarkers. So let's break this down just a little bit. Next slide. Uh, what I'd like to point out here is that according to Lee et al., MRE alone by itself has a higher AUC than MRE in combination with other imaging biomarkers, 0.89 versus 0.81 to 0.85. So based on this study, we would argue that MRE alone suffices and the addition of other biomarkers does not help. However, next slide. In the uh, R01 that Scott and I have, the emerging data that we're finding is that MRE and PDFF in combination have a slightly higher AUC than MRE alone or than MRE in combination with uh, corrected uh, T1. Again, this is emerging data. Next slide. Um, now, just to put this in context, uh, up above, we see the performance of MRE alone, 0.81 to 0.89 AUC. Uh, depending on the study, notice that MRE in combination with other biomarkers uh, may have slightly higher performance. Uh, Nuradin found that MAST has an AUC of 0.93. Kim found that MAST has an AUC of 0.72. So still some inconsistent results in the literature, and this still needs to be resolved. Next slide. Uh, and from a head-to-head -head study, uh, we find that MIFID may be superior to MAST. Uh, this needs to be verified by additional studies. Next slide. Okay, now what about non-serotic at-risk NASH? Next slide. So no studies have directly addressed this context of use. Next slide. Uh, so is MRE in combination with other biomarkers ready for prime time? Next slide. Uh, next slide. So for F greater than two, five studies, different combined biomarkers, I would argue that yes, we don't know the exact combination, but the data is fairly compelling, and we are hoping to qualify MRE in combination with other biomarkers at Nimble. What about at-risk NASH? Next slide. Four studies, inconsistent data, but uh, I would argue that probably uh, MRE in combination will be able to detect at-risk NASH, and we are hoping to qualify it for this purpose in Nimble. Finally, non-serotic at-risk NASH. Next slide. Uh, zero published studies, but it's quite plausible that MRE would be able to exclude cirrhosis. We need data. We hope to get the data in Nimble. Next slide, please. Um, let me skip this in the interest of time. Next slide. Okay, now let's look at treatment response defined as a one-stage reduction in fibrosis as well as resolution or and or resolution of NASH. Next slide. 
Let's start with one stage reduction in fibrosis. Next slide. At least 23 studies have used change in MRE stiffness and an endpoint in a clinical trial or in um, observational monitoring studies. Next slide, please. However, only eight of those 23 studies had paired biopsies at the beginning of the study and at the end of the study. Next slide. And only two of the studies actually reported or provided data that allowed me to extract the data to assess the accuracy of change in MRE stiffness for classifying histologic response. So 23 studies, but only two provided the data to assess the performance of MRE for assessing treatment response or monitoring response. Next slide. And here are the two papers published in 2019 and 2020. Uh, one is a treatment response paper, one is a monitoring paper. Next slide. Uh, and next slide, just, just keep on advancing in the interest of time and I'll tell you when to stop. Keep on advancing, keep on advancing and advance and advance one more time. Okay, stop, thank you. No, one back. Uh, here's the punchline on the bottom left uh, in a randomized clinical trial, it was found that emery stiffness as a classifier of fibrosis response had an AUC of 0.62, a cutoff was 0%, sensitivity 67, specificity 64%. In the monitoring study by Ejmera, he found that a 15% increase of emery stiffness classifies fibrosis progression with the sensitivity and specificity shown below. Next slide. How about resolution of NASH with no worsening of fibrosis? Next slide. No published studies have looked at this. Next slide. So is Emory ready for prime time to assess treatment response? Next slide. Next slide. The simple answer is no, there is not yet enough data. Next slide. A more nuanced answer, however, next slide is that we need a new paradigm. Next slide. Uh, the conventional paradigm is illustrated here. Uh, a randomized clinical trial, for example, may get biopsy at day one and end of treatment with MRE performed at baseline and end of treatment. And for that, we try to assess the accuracy of MRE. However, I would argue that this is a flawed paradigm. Next slide. Because uh, biopsy is noisy at baseline, it's noisy at end of treatment, and it's mainly noisy because of the spatial variability, in my opinion, and because the gold standard is noisy, it'll be almost impossible to show that Emory can assess treatment response. Next slide. So this is a flawed paradigm. Next slide. And if we don't change this paradigm, next slide, I think we will never be able to uh, qualify Emory for assessing treatment response. And if we have this workshop in 10 years, I think we'll be having the same discussion. Next slide. So we need a new paradigm. Uh, an incremental change might be to do two biopsies at baseline and two biopsies at end of treatment. I would argue that this is incremental, but I also understand that this may simply be impossible. Next slide. And so we need a more transformative paradigm shift where instead of trying to um, link MRE to fibrosis, we need to link MRE to clinical outcomes and to clinical benefit. Next slide. There have been at least 11 studies since 2018 that have shown that MRE stiffness or its change predicts outcome. Next slide. Um, I don't have the time to go over them uh, today. So I'd like to wrap up by saying there is strong evidence that 2D MRE stiffness can be a diagnostic enrichment biomarker for fibrosis greater than or equal to two. There is emerging evidence that 2D MRE can be a diagnostic enrichment biomarker for at-risk NASH, either alone or in combination. But we do need a new paradigm if we're trying to qualify MRE for assessing treatment response. I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to now turn over the floor uh, to my colleague and friend, Scott Reeder, who will be speaking about uh, uh, proton density fat fraction as well as T1 relaxation. Good morning. Thank you very much for the organizers of this session for the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Scott Reeder. I'm a radiologist specializing in cardiovascular and abdominal imaging at the University of Wisconsin. And I'm going to be speaking about CT1 and proton density fat fraction as MRI-based biomarkers of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. First, I do have some disclosures, some unrelated conflicts that are listed here at the top. 
I do have some related conflicts, specifically that I'm a founder of Calimetrics, as well as an inventor of multiple US patents related to PDFF and T1 mapping, which are consigned to Stanford or the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation. In addition, today, I'm really going to focus on the data that I have found in the literature. I will do my best to take an objective approach, although I also would note that on occasion, some of what I'm going to say is based on my experience as well as some of my own opinion. Some highlights and overviews. First of all, there are multiple MRI-based multi-parametric quantitative biomarkers, including T1, PDFF, R2 star, as well as MR elastography. What I'm going to focus on for this talk are the first two, T1 and PDFF. I'm going to talk about diagnostic performance, treatment monitoring, and briefly at the end, touch a little bit about on some emerging data on outcomes. First of all, let's talk about T1 as a biomarker for NASH. T1 is a relaxation parameter that is considered to be a fundamental magnetic property of tissue. In a liver that has inflammation and fibrosis, this leads to an increase in water content, which leads to an increase in the apparent T1. One of the challenges is that there are a lot of things that happen in the presence of inflammation and fibrosis, for example, changes in macromolecular content, which can impact the apparent T1. So the exact mechanistic relationship between changes in T1 and histological features of liver disease is not well understood, although generally it's thought to be related to the water content. T1 mapping in the liver, current status is that there are no FDA approved acquisition methods that are specific to the liver. However, there are FDA approved methods that are in the heart. There's been a lot of T1 mapping in the heart in the literature over the past decade. Cardiac acquisition methods, however, do work well in the liver, and you can generally get about one slice per breath hold. The CT1 technique, which I'll talk a little bit about in a minute, is a post-processing technique that uses the cardiac T1 mapping as applied to the liver, and that approach was approved in 2017. There are CPT codes, 0648T and 0649T, that can be applied for quantitative mapping in multiple organs, such as the heart, as well as the liver, and are applicable to the C1 technology. There are some uh, challenges for T1 mapping in general, including CT1. Now, the presence of iron is interesting because this shortens the actual T1, which is the opposite effect of increasing the T1. So in a liver that has both fibrosis and iron overload, these are competing effects. The C1 T, uh, technology actually compensates for the presence of the iron, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Fat can confound T1 or CT1 because fat has a shorter T1 than water. And when we have an admixture of those two, which can occur in fatty liver, um, that will lead to a shorter apparent T1. Macromolecular content is also important, um, and this can impact something called magnetization transfer, which can confound the apparent T1 T measurement. And T1 also depends on field strength. And so as we increase the number of scanners from 1.5T to 3T, we get different apparent values of T1 at different field strengths. Some other challenges uh, include the fact that the gold standard methods needed to measure T1 are simply not feasible. This takes a very long scan time. And so as a result, we've used the faster methods such as those in the heart. These take some shortcuts that lead to corruption of the signal that ultimately leads to variability across platforms and methods. So standardization becomes a very big issue uh, to address these confounders. The other question that I alluded to earlier is what is the signal actually measuring? Because it's well understood within the cardiac MRI literature that changes in the apparent T1 in the heart using these so-called MOLLE techniques may actually reflect changes in the macromolecular content. And it's really not known what is going on with this in the liver and whether this is an issue or not. PDFF uh, is a little bit more straightforward. Uh, this is an imaging voxel that contains triglycerides, as well as water molecules and other MR invisible substances. And when we uh, do an experiment with MRI, what we're actually looking at are the protons. If we're able to separate the signal from the triglyceride protons and the water protons, we can create a proton density fat fraction, which is simply defined as the ratio of the signal from the protons in fat relative to the protons of fat and water, and in this case, 
approximately 39%. And what is known is that PDFF is a fundamental property of tissue that reflects the concentration of fat. We measure PDFF using chemical shift-based water fat separation techniques where we have a separated water and fat image. And by taking that ratio, we're able to obtain a PDFF map, in this case, approximately 25%. It's well understood that PDFF is a well-validated biomarker of hepatic steatosis with numerous studies in phantoms, animal studies, biopsy-based studies, as well as large uh, MRS studies as well. These techniques can acquire images over the entire liver within a 20-second breath hold. It's widely considered to be the most accurate and precise method to measure liver fat, highly reproducible and repeatable, and it's FDA-approved on numerous vendors, and it's also been used as a key endpoint in pharma trials. For clinical care, it's relatively inexpensive, about the same cost as an ultrasound. It's simply a 20-second breath hold, and for this reason, it's starting to gain widespread clinical use, and we can use those same CPT codes to apply to chemical shift encoded MRI. PDFF was first introduced in 2011 on the GE platform, but it has been subsequently implemented and approved on other platforms. CT1 is a little bit more recent and was first introduced about five years ago as part of the liver multi-scan package by Perspectum. Now, T1 mapping, uh, and this is not CT1, but this is conventional T1 mapping, has been examined for looking at the diagnosis or for the detection of different stages of fibrosis. And what we can see over here on the right is that we have a different area under the curve for different criteria depending on the staging of fibrosis. And we can see that generally speaking, the area under the curve is on the order of about 0.6, maybe almost reaching about 0.8. So I would say modest uh, diagnostic performance for the detection of fibrosis. In 2014, Banerjee et al. published this landmark paper on CT1 as a biomarker for NASH. And this is a technique that uses R2 star maps as a metric of iron concentration to compensate for the shortening of T1 due to the presence of iron and, and therefore potentially improving the accuracy of this approach. And here we see some very nice uh, CT1 maps compared to biopsy specimens. And when we look at this larger population, we can see that CT1 is able to stratify the normal liver from these various stages of fibrosis. And we'll come back to this in a minute. There are some uh, gaps in the data for T1 mapping as well as CT1. The biggest one, in my opinion, is that there are currently no direct comparisons of T1 with CT1 to demonstrate the improvement or added value in diagnostic performance or the added value of the of this iron-based correction. And, and one thing that's important to note is that most of the clinical populations studied so far do not have any significant iron overload. There are also limited data on the, re, uh, on the repeatability and reproducibility of T1, as well as CT1 and NAFLD. There, here's one paper that I'm aware of with 32 healthy volunteers and 29 patients with mixed liver disease demonstrating a coefficient of repeatability and reproducibility as listed here. And uh, if we look at this coefficient of reproducibility, and compare this to that separation of fibrosis staging from the Banerjee paper, what we can see is that between normal and lower stages of fibrosis, we have relatively good separation that exceeds that coefficient of reproducibility, um, perhaps not as good at the higher stages of fibrosis, but regardless, we can still see that there is this increase, monotonic increase in a CT1 with fibrosis stage. PDFF, on the other hand, has a longer track record and more data. Uh, this is a meta-analysis of 23 studies in almost 1,700 patients that demonstrated a coefficient of repeatability of 3% and coefficient of reproducibility of 4%. And if we compare that variability to this very nice study by Tang et al. for uh, stratification of steatosis grade based on the PDFF, we can see that the degree of variability is relatively small compared to the separation that we're seeing between the different grades of steatosis. T1 as a biomarker of NASH, this is something that my group has been looking at carefully in collaboration with a number of other groups. We've completed a comprehensive search of the literature, and as part of the search, we've identified 56 papers on quantitative T1 mapping in the liver. 11 of these are focused on NAFLD NASH. And of those 11, there are five that are specifically related to CT1 for NAFLD-NASH. And I just want to touch on these quickly, as this was my mandate for this talk. 
Here are those papers. I'll just leave this here just for a moment. If you'd like to do a screenshot listing the various studies examining CT1 in patients with known or suspected nafldi nash I boiled this down into this chart here, which again lists those same papers, the number of subjects, the population, whether they had healthy subjects or not, whether this was single or multi-site, and multiple other metrics as well. On the far right, I've also listed the level of evidence based on this paper by Bonmati et al. I want to focus on this central column here. Not all of the papers reported the diagnostic performance. For example, the first paper reported by Harrison and all looked at a correlation between CT1 and fibrosis. But we can see here in this paper by Eddowes that in patients with uh, NASH, we're able to achieve areas under the curve on the order of about 0.7, a little bit higher comparing healthy versus patients. Uh, Dennis et al., similar results. And then Amaho et al. at the bottom, I'd like to expand on a little bit more because th this was really a much more comprehensive single site study in 145 patients. So here's that paper so that you can look it up in the literature. And I boiled this paper down. They're, they did a lot of different things. They looked at uh, ultrasound-based biomarkers, serum-based biomarkers, but what I've listed here are the MRI-based biomarkers. Here we have the imaging test, PDFF, MR elastography, measuring liver stiffness, and CT1 for the detection of steatosis, NASH, stratification to at-risk NASH, and fibrosis. And what we see, first of all, is that PDFF does very well for the detection of steatosis, as we'd expect. But interestingly, modestly well, or 0.8, area under the curve for the detection of NASH, not so good for the detection of fibrosis. MRE, as expected, does very well for the detection of fibrosis with an area under the curve of 0.92. CT1, on the other hand, does modestly well for the detection of NASH and at-risk NASH, not so well for steatosis or fibrosis. This paper also looked at the combination of CT1 and PDFF, and what they found is that there was a modest increase from 0.8 with PDFF adding CT1, and with the logistic regression, we're able to show an area under the curve of 0.83 for NASH, and a little bit better as well for at-risk NASH. It would have been interesting to have compared MRE and PDFF to combine these together, given the high performance of PDFF for steatosis and modest performance for NASH and the high performance for fibrosis, but that was not reported, and neither was the combination of all three of these biomarkers. However, this has been done effectively by the Mayo Group, by Lee et al. This recently was published in Hepatology, comparing stiffness from MRE, PDFF, and conventional T1, uh, not CT1, but conventional T1, in a cross-sectional prospective study, 104 patients who underwent biopsy within approximately one day of the MRI. So very high quality study. Here are the results. For the detection of NASH, the single best biomarker was in fact PDFF. If you look at the combination of other biomarkers, liver stiffness and T1, and T1, it does not do much to change that diagnosis. The at-risk NASH was best stratified using liver stiffness as measured by MRE. And these authors concluded that PDFF has the best performance for the identification of NASH a single, as a single biomarker, and MRE has the best performance for stratifying low-risk versus at-risk NASH. This paper also examined the relationship between PDFF and T1 in these two cohorts of patients. And what you can see is that there's a relatively collinear relationship between the two. What we'd really like to see between two different biomarkers is that these are orthogonal and that we could use the combination of these to separate the NASH from the non-NASH, which we, we don't observe with these data. Now, we've looked at this. Um, this is a, some preliminary results from an ongoing study at my own institution in collaboration with uh, UC San Diego and Claude Serlin's group. And what we have found in obese patients undergoing weight loss surgery is that PDFF is able to, to achieve good separation between normal steatosis and NASH based on the PDFF with an area under the curve of about 0.91. So very exciting results, although there are further data to be examined and we will be reporting that soon. We've also looked at CT1 in the same patients and also here we can see that there's a separation between these three groups using CT1 with an area under the curve of 0.383. In fact, I believe this is the best performance of any study to date for CT1 separating NASH from patients without NASH.
Here is uh, some exciting work from Rohit Lumba's group at UCSD demonstrating that PDFF is associated with the progression of fibrosis. And in this study, what they showed is that those patients who undergo liver biopsy and PDFF measurement at the initial time point that have a PDFF greater than 15.7%, that they have an odds ratio of 6.67% for subsequently developing fibrosis almost two years later. And what this really means in my view is that they must have had some sort of level of NASH or liver injury at the beginning as predicted by a relatively high PDFF value that resulted in subsequent liver injury and fibrosis. PDFF also has been shown to predict histological response to treatment. Here are the manuscripts that I've been able to find in the literature. And if you, again, if you'd like to screenshot that, that would be fine. A couple of these are review articles. Here's a very nice article, again, written by Rohit Lumba at UCSD and a number of other luminaries in the NASH space. And what this work showed is that a greater than 30% relative drop in PDFF leads to a greater than two point drop in the NASH activity score in 50% of patients. And if the relative drop is higher, the number of patients that experience an improvement in their histology will also increase as well. Here's another review article from that list I showed earlier from Tamaki et al. Um, these are a number of those articles uh, listed in that paper. And one of the specific papers, another paper by Tamaki et al., I just want to blow this up here because I think this is a very important result, is that they showed that a 30% relative decline in MRI PDFF was an independent predictor of fibrosis regression with a high odds uh, ratio as shown here. CT1 also has been shown to be a biomarker of treatment response, not quite as much data, but here are the three papers I'm aware of by Stephen Harrison, as well as Vlad Ratsui et al. I'd like to just touch base quickly on that last paper from the Journal of Hepatology and some of those results in patients undergoing placebo-controlled study examining an FXR agonist. Here we see the change in T1 from baseline and placebo compared to two doses of CT1, and you can see similar results with MRI PDFF. Quickly on outcomes, limited data on PDFF, and there's really not much out there, so there's not a lot to say about that. There are some data, however, with CT1, and this is an older paper using an LIF score, which is a composite score that includes CT1 that demonstrates that it can predict the liver-related event-free survival as shown on this Kaplan-Meier plot. Some very exciting data recently came out of the UK Biobank that also shows that CT1 is associated with an increasing risk of cardiovascular events and all-cause mortality. So in conclusion, in my opinion, uh, for T1 and CT1 as a biomarker of a fatty liver disease, there's clear signal in the T1 and CT1 with increasing liver disease severity. There are continuing technical development underway, the number of investigators examining how to mitigate the effects of fat and magnetization transfer, as well as developing rapid breath hold and free breathing methods. The added value of CT1 compared to T1 mapping alone is unknown. In my opinion, more clinical data are needed for both T1 and CT1 for evaluating the diagnostic performance of NASH, including cohorts that have elevated liver iron. That's particularly relevant for CT1. More reproducibility data are needed, and there's some very exciting treatment response data that are coming out, but I think more data are needed to better understand that. And there are some exciting emerging data coming out on outcomes. For PDFF, what we see is that it's a highly validated biomarker of liver fat. It is considered to be the gold standard. It's approved by multiple vendors. It's considered to be the most accurate and precise biomarker of liver fat. It has an established role in the treatment monitoring of NASH. And in fact, it's now emerging as the most accurate single non-invasive test for the diagnosis of NASH. But unfortunately, there are limited data on outcomes. In the future, I think that we need to be looking at more multi-parametric analysis with combinations of imaging and serum biomarkers, but that's a whole other topic in itself. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention, and I look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you to all of our speakers so far today, and welcome, everyone. I'm Dan Cranach, the Assistant Director in the Division of Radiological Imaging and Radiation Therapy in the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. As a reminder, the primary focus of the workshop is non-serotic NASH-MASH population with advanced liver fibrosis. During this panel discussion, 
We're especially interested to hear from the radiological imaging-based biomarker experts about how these biomarkers may be used as prognostic enrichment, diagnostic, and response biomarkers. As a reminder, please limit responses to one to two minutes and raise your hands. Now we will allow each panelist who has not given a talk so far about three to five minutes for introduction and presenting their initial thoughts, perspectives, and responses. First up, Dr. Banerjee, please introduce yourself and provide your perspectives on this topic. Thank you, Dan. Uh, my name is Rajashi Banerjee. I'm a consultant physician in Oxford in the UK. Uh, I'm also a founder, employee, and shareholder in Perspectum. That's an Oxford University spin-out company for translational medical sciences. And I hold uh, some patents, uh, some of which are US granted in MR image processing, including, and that's relevant to today, the measurement of corrected T1 or CT1. I receive no direct payments from pharma or biotech. Um, so for my comments, firstly, thank you for a great session for the three speakers. Um, uh, compared to some of the others, I think you've really distilled some of the data. Uh, liver disease is undoubtedly an exciting field of research. Um, the organ has at least nine functions, two circulations, can regenerate like a newt's tail. And if I'm allowed to talk in children's science, it's cool. But we're not here for that. I'm not here for that. I'm here because liver disease is a public health emergency. And I would ask this community to use that framework. Um, I trained in cardiology, general medicine, and public health, and I came into this field in 2008 because I had seen young, previously asymptomatic patients die prematurely from heart attacks, and there seemed to be an association with pre-existing liver disease. Fifteen years later, I was part of research um, that showed that people with fatty liver disease were five times more likely to get hospitalized in the UK uh, if they got COVID. So clearly, steatohepatitis matters, and I think we're in a position to diagnose that non-invasively. We know that liver disease is a modifiable risk factor for cardiovascular disease and is also a driver for liver endpoints. Yesterday, we had uh, sessions on what does a change in pathology mean for a hepatologist or a pathologist. Histopathology is, is brilliant for microscopic tissue and structural insights, and I'm involved in a lot of histology research. Um, and it's very necessary for rare and complex diseases like autoimmune hepatitis. But in a public health emergency, let's consider this. What do the changes in pathology mean for a patient with suspected NASH or for a public health program or to a cardiologist or to a humble internist like myself? I think clinical outcomes for trials should reflect the clinical outcomes of interest to patients, their doctors, and their healthcare providers. And so for large scale clinical trials, I just think biopsy is unsafe for patients, period. Um, we had an introductory talk from a uh, master statistician at the FDA. Um, I'd ask you to calculate this. Each liver biopsy carries a 2.4% major complication rate, Tamiades Brias et al. If a typical trial needs 1,000 to 1,500 patients, entailing three times that number of biopsies, if from this audience there are three phase three trials with 10,000 patients, that's 240 complications and one likely death. Are we comfortable in this audience committing resources to bio biopsy-based trials where we know we're going to harm that many people? In the study of fibrosis, you know, in cardiac and pulmonary fibrosis, we do not use histology to assess them. So I'm not asking uh, the FDA to invent a new way of doing medicine here. We can assess myocardial fibrosis with MRI. So I would urge us to see if we can do the same in the liver. I would contend the evidence for reproducibility, repeatability, validation against histology, cardiac and liver outcomes is there. There is a greater body of evidence from many sources for CT1 as a reasonably likely surrogate endpoint now than there was for histological fibrosis or NASH resolution when the FDA accepted them as reasonably likely surrogate endpoints based on the work of the late Paul Angulo and um, Matthias Eggstedt. I feel we'd all benefit from a, a deep breath and a step back to see this from the doctor and patient perspectives uh, in a structured framework with a public health emergency in the background. 42% of Americans are obese, and the federal budget for diabetes is $3.4 trillion. 
There's an urgency in preventing obesity related disease that I do not think is fully appreciated. As a doctor, I don't know if GLP-1 agonists or FGF-21 analogs have clinical benefits in NASH, but I and many others suspect they will, and there's an urgency to find out. So as a pres prescribing doctor and as a, a son and a husband and a father, I don't care what these agents do to histology. I care that the adherence to histology is stopping us from running large, safe clinical trials, which can then answer the fundamental questions on clinical benefits in patients with non cirrhotic NASH. I think the current data in this day and age can overcome this barrier with imaging biomarkers that are reasonably likely surrogate endpoints. So my request to the agency is to share all the data, not just that shown today, and consider all of it uh, in terms of reasonably likely surrogate endpoints in non cirrhotic NASH. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Banerjee. Next up, Dr. Eamon, if you would please introduce yourself and provide your thoughts on the subject. Well, good morning. I'm grateful uh, to the FDA leadership for holding this timely workshop. And I'd also like to thank Drs. Newsom, Serlin, and Reeder uh, for their outstanding presentations. So I'm a diagnostic radiologist at the Mayo Clinic, and I lead a research program that is focused on developing advanced MRI technology. Our team discovered a way to image propagating shear waves in tissue with MRI, and that led us to develop MR elastography, which was first described in the journal Science in 1995. Now, diagnosing liver fibrosis was an obvious target, but it took us nearly a decade to translate it to clinical imaging. It's been available from MRI manufacturers as an FDA cleared tool since 2009. Now for disclosure, one of my assignments at the Mayo Clinic is to serve as CEO of Resounded Incorporated, a company formed by Mayo to work with MRI manufacturers to implement MRE properly and in a standardized way across all of the uh, MRI scanners and that's been done. So I'm looking forward to the panel uh, questions and the panel discussion but I'd just like to briefly comment on one area. I think Dr. Newsom and uh, Dr. Serlin nicely summarized the accumulated evidence supporting the use of liver stiffness as a biomarker for liver fibrosis. Much of the evidence is based on studies that have used histopathology as a standard of truth. The, pro the presentations on histopathology yesterday appropriately focused on the problem of inter-observer variation in histopathology. Now, AI-based techniques certainly may address this to some extent, but frankly, I'm always struck by the relative lack of attention in the community to an equally important source of uncertainty in histopathology as a biomarker, and it's the sampling effect. Now, Dr. Serlin alluded to this at the end of his presentation. A biopsy specimen is a tiny sample of a large organ that often has heterogeneous disease. Studies have shown that when biopsy specimens are obtained from two locations in the liver in patients with liver fibrosis, they will often demonstrate different fibrosis stages. In fact, 30 to 50% of the time, according to the literature. So if biopsy specimens are obtained before and after an intervention, the second biopsy may show apparent progression or improvement, even if the intervention has no effect. Now, this is surely one of the explanations for the placebo response often seen in pharma trials. Now, MRE detects uh, stiffness over large regions of the liver, and we know from our clinical experience that many patients with liver fibrosis in the NASH spectrum have very heterogeneous liver stiffness. A recent study from Japan showed that discordance between MRE-based liver fibrosis staging and histopathology staging is more common in patients with heterogeneous liver stiffness than those with more homogeneous patterns of liver stiffness. So I would hope to see more attention paid to the significance of biopsy sampling effects when histopathology is used as a surrogate endpoint. And finally, as we focus on what type of evidence might be needed in order to consider non-invasive biomarkers for treatment response, I think that a broader understanding of the noise characteristics of histopathology as a standard of truth should be factored into that discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Eamon. Next up, I'd like to have Dr. Fetzer introduce yourself and please provide your thoughts and perspectives on this topic. Thanks, I appreciate the opportunity and uh, uh, the invitation to be a part of this prestigious panel. Um, uh, 
So I am medical director of ultrasound at UT Southwestern, two large uh, medical systems down in Dallas, one university-based and one uh, county community-based. And so it's um, being in Texas and being in Dallas, seeing the epidemic of fatty liver disease gives me a, a unique perspective and how ultrasound could uh, be a component of uh, impacting uh, the diagnosis and management of this disease. Uh, I appreciate uh, Dr. Newsom's introduction to ultrasound-based uh, uh, biomarkers for liver uh, fibrosis and, and fat, and, and wish to say that we're, we're equally excited about the uh, image-based uh, biomarkers of shear wave elastography and the emerging uh, techniques for liver fat quantification. And I would probably um, be supported by other radiologists to say that the vibration control transient elastography and shear wave elastography techniques are, are likely equivalent in their reproducibility and diagnostic ability may not be as uh, accurate as uh, MR elastography, but as a uh, ultrasound-based tool, we have to consider uh, in a uh, population-based uh, disease like uh, NAFLD, uh, the, the safety access and cost. Now, of course, I know this discussion is primarily based on uh, pharma trials um, and, and biomarkers in, in, uh, in clinical research, uh, but I think the the, the long term um, forward thinking um, uh, point of view should be that ultrasound has a big uh, part to play in in its access on a population level and a worldwide health, uh, level. One of the things that I w would like to point out that we've all kind of touched on a little bit is that it's unlikely to have one biomarker that's gonna be able to answer all of our questions. But the talks yesterday highlighted the, the, the various parameters that a, a pathologist is looking at on a glass slide, and then returning to biomarkers like serum panels and, and imaging tests and hoping that one biomarker can answer all of these questions. And I think that's a little naive. I think uh, uh, data showed by uh, Dr. Serlin and Dr. Reeder show that likely multiple parameters, whether within one modality or across modalities, are, are likely to be more impactful than a single modality from a single or a single biomarker from a single modality. So I think a lot of research does need to occur in that space of intra and intermodality, multi-parametric, multi-biomarker uh, assessments. Um, of course, I don't think that's ready for prime time, as Dr. Serlin was uh, uh, pointing out, but I think that's definitely an area uh, rich for uh, further investigation. I also wish to point out that there's, a, I think, a flaw in trying to bucket state, uh, um, disease processes like fibrosis into stages, so F0, F1, F2, et cetera, when a lot of the biomarkers we're talking about are continuous scales. And I think we need to leverage the, the continuous scales um, because we lose a lot of that data when you try to bucket that into a specific disease stage. Uh, several of the talks yesterday talked about how there's a wide range of, say, collagen just within F3 or just within F4. Um, so there could be a dramatic change in the amount of collagen and maybe the amount of stiffness, even if, if histologically the patient hasn't actually changed a, a stage of fibrosis. So I think we're not leveraging the, the ability of all these biomarkers to be continuous scales and to be, be able to pick up um, meaningful reproducible differences in disease processes that are lost when we try to bucket them um, into uh, ordinal categories. Um, and I also think that one of the areas uh, that we haven't yet talked about is the longitudinal follow-up. I know Dr. Searle and Dr. Reeder talked a little bit about that and how there's a paucity of literature in using these uh, reproducible uh, non-invasive biomarkers longitudinally, and I think ultrasound has a, a huge part to play there because, again, of the uh, cost, accessibility, um, and access. But as far as uh, being ready for prime time for FDA trials, I think that the literature is still emerging. There's still a lot of research to be done. There's, there's a lot of promise, uh, but admittedly, I think th these are going to be more population health uh, related clinical uh, tools, um, uh, probably hopefully long after these trials are completed. So uh, thank you again for the uh, allowing me to particip participate. I look forward to further discussions. Thank you very much, Dr. Fetzer. Dr. Fornia, please introduce yourself and provide your perspectives on this topic. So good morning, everyone. I would like to first start by thanking the FDA for organizing this workshop and uh, allowing me to, to, to be part of this panel discussion. 
So I'm Céline Fournier, the Chief Medical Officer at Ecosense. I have a bioengineering background and did my PhD in tissue characterization using ultrasound-based biomarker. And I then joined Ecosense to work on the clinical development of the fibro scan. Now, over the last uh, 20 years, Ecosense has been developing uh, liver stiffness by VCT which is now used uh, in routine clinical practice extensively uh, and can be considered somehow as a marker of liver health across all uh, liver diseases. This has been recently, uh, well, not so recently actually, but this is illustrated, for example, by the Baveno guidelines, uh, which propose this rule of five uh, to risk stratify patients, uh, regardless of the etiology, uh, and independently from the fibrosis stage. Uh, in addition uh, to uh, liver stiffness by VCT and CAP, uh, several uh, composite biomarkers have been proposed to refine the diagnosis and monitoring of MAFLD patients. So Professor Newsom mentioned the FAST, which uh, is intended to uh, identify at-risk NASH patients. And more recently, the Agile score were also proposed to uh, better identify patients with advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis. Now, uh, we believe that liver stiffness by VCT is uh, very well positioned uh, to be a potential reasonably likely surrogate endpoint. Uh, and here are the reasons why we believe that. Uh, first of all, it is a direct measure of an intrinsic physical property of the liver. Uh, so uh, this is something which is um, very well established in terms of a measurement method with a standardized uh, measurement method. Uh, it is also uh, an individual biomarker, uh, so it is something which is therefore easier to consider in terms of uh, analytical validation. And it is not, uh, unlike SCORE, something which has been modeled to uh, against histology to answer specific questions. It is really a biomechanical property of, of the liver, which turns out to be correlated with plenty of different things. Now, as shown by Professor Newsom, there is a significant level of clinical evidence uh, on uh, its performance. So uh, uh, for diagnosis, for example, there was no time to review all the literature, but in addition to the two pivotal papers mentioned by Professor Newsom, there are now very large meta-analyses, one on the 53 studies run by Litmus, and an individual patient data meta-analysis on more than 5,700 patients. Uh, regarding treatment response, we saw some examples of publication, but there are several abstracts out there. Uh, on prognostic, uh, Professor Newsom also showed that uh, now we have several publications on the link between a baseline liver stiffness and the risk of liver-related events and mortality. And we now have emerging data also on uh, how an increased uh, liver stiffness over time is associated with an increased risk of clinical outcome. New results uh, are upcoming uh, on monitoring disease progression and regression uh, on large cohorts. So stay tuned, there will be uh, new data at ASLD. And since liver stiffness by VCT is currently serially assessed in all of the phase three trials in non cirrhotic NASH patients, we can expect uh, new data on its usefulness sorry, uh, for the assessment of treatment response. Last but not least, uh, in the current FDA approved uh, indication for use for the fibro scan uh, medical devices, uh, there are already some key concepts which uh, are there, which are uh, the use of uh, fibroscan uh, as a net for the diagnosis and monitoring of patients with suspected uh, or confirmed liver disease, and also that liver stiffness can be used as a net in determining the likelihood of cirrhosis and a net in the assessment of liver fibrosis. So we believe that qualifying liver stiffness by VCT as a as a likelihood, uh, reasonably sorry, likely surrogate endpoint, uh, can be achieved uh, through the biomarker qualification program, but also uh, maybe from a consensus from the field. Thanks to this workshop, uh, we hope that uh, all stakeholders will, will align on the strengths of the existing level of clinical evidence 
uh, and that we will be able to identify uh, the knowledge gaps that needs to be filled. And then once identified, uh, the idea is obviously to work together mm. with uh, clinicians, consortia, the pharma industry and the regulators to address them. Thank you very much and looking forward to the discussion as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Fournier. And our final panelist, Dr. Dodd, would you please introduce yourself and provide any initial thoughts? Yeah, thank you. So um, I'm Lori Dodd. I'm a biostatistician at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. My research areas are clinical trials and biomarkers um, and uh, evaluating uh, diagnostic accuracy of biomarkers. So, so a few comments I want to make. I mean, it, this was a really great session. It emphasized the importance of having alternative non-invasive endpoints in NASH clinical trials. Um, the disease burden it, it clearly mandates or faster trials and um, biomarkers demonstrate clear potential to improve the speed of clinical trials. However, we can't become so focused on faster trials that we fail to keep our priority focused on the importance of proving that products have clinical benefit with a biomarker that satisfies conditions for a reasonable surrogate. Um, so just thinking about the presentations, a few comments, I mean, it was really great to learn more about the potential of these imaging biomarkers. I thought the presentations were very clear to distinguish between the different uses of biomarkers with a focus on diagnostic enrichment and treatment monitoring. However, for use as a clinical trial endpoint, the endpoint needs to uh, characterize either how a pa patient function feels or survives, and also the changes that changes in that endpoint um, also characterize either improvements or worsening in how a patient functions, feels, or survives, or it needs to demonstrate criteria for surrogacy, which then means that the changes in the biomarker uh, it, between either the treatment arm and the placebo arm capture um, the changes in the clinical endpoint. Um, and, and prediction of treatment response alone does not provide sufficient evidence to inform whether the changes in the biomarker um, predicts the changes in, in the clinical outcome. So some, some questions that remain, um, just going through some of the um, the guidance that the FDA has published um, in terms of validating surrogacy and evaluating biomarkers for clinical trials. Causality, is there enough knowledge about the disease process to convince us that the biomarkers are on the single direct causal pathway to the clinical disease outcome? Proportionality, um, to what extent does the magnitude of change in the surrogate explain the disease or the magnitude of change in the disease status or burden? An evaluation of spectrum bias, which I saw a little bit presented about about this, and I think there should be more, um, which is really the potential for complicating effects. Have other factors affecting the disease outcomes been adequately evaluated to understand the performance of biomarkers? And as a side note, you know, when when I hear um, when I look at meta analyses, to me, one of the most informative and interesting parts of the meta analyses are not the summary statistics, but rather the variability between the studies. And I spend a lot of time trying to understand what's driving those differences. Is there something real there? Is there something that informs us about the use uh, of these biomarkers? Um, and then the last thing is about universality. So to what extent is there evidence across drug mechanisms or across different populations? I, mean, I think this is probably a bit premature because um, there haven't been direct discussions about um, sort of what kinds of interventions would be considered, but one needs to consider different class effects of drugs and drug mechanisms and how that might um, differentially be affected um, by the biomarkers and whether the biomarker a potential surrogate would actually capture um, the uh, treatment effects uh, across these different classes of drugs. So I'll, I'll stop. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Dodd. So it's a couple comments for myself. So I'd like to, I guess, remind or, or potentially, I guess, agree with the panel that, you know, histology is already a, a surrogate. It's not kind of a meaningful endpoint in and of itself. And, and also sometimes, um, demonstrating that one surrogate has agreement with another surrogate in order to kind of predict kind of something clinically meaningful may not be the best pathway to proceed because there's lots of challenges when looking at kind of two uh, potential um, diagnostic uh, biomarkers or other biomarkers in terms of agreement. And so maybe for the purpose of this panel, at least we could 
think of uh, histology as maybe a reference standard, uh, maybe not the gold standard, and I think maybe place a little more emphasis on what can we do to kind of move past the kind of use and agreement of analysis on an imperfect reference standard to get additional evidence um, supporting that these radiological imaging based biomarkers, you know, will predict or lead to kind of clinically meaningful outcomes and changes. So with that, I will hand it off to Abbas to ask the first question. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you so much, Dan. Our first question um, we'd like to ask uh, the panelists are, are there data that inform the relative contributions of inflammation versus fibrosis, fibrosis in NASH MASH with imaging-based tests? Um, doc, Dr. Amon, could you um, provide your input? Go ahead, Dr. Amon. Well, thank you. Um, I can I can respond uh, as it relates to MRE. Uh, for MRE, several recent studies have shown that the increment in stiffness associated with chronic inflammation that we see in NASH is rather small in comparison to the steps between F1 and F4 fibrosis. So there was a 2021 study published in European Radiology that measured the increment in stiffness between no and severe uh, inflammation, and that was on the order of 0.3 kilopascals. So, uh, and then in the, in the 2023 meta-analysis of 798 patients uh, with, with MAPLD that was published in the Journal of Hepatology and it came from the litmus group, it showed a stiffness difference between no and severe inflammatory activity of about between 0.2 and 0.3 kilopascals. So that impacts the accuracy of staging F1 fibrosis, but the steps between other um, stages are much larger. So the severity of, and in that study, the severity of inflammatory act activity had no detectable change on the diagnostic performance in fibrosis staging for F2, F3, and F4 fibrosis. And as you recall, the AUCs for those, uh, those um, uh, diagnostic performance was 0.92 and 0.94 uh, in that range, which is really the theoretical limit of what can be achieved with histopathology uh, when, when histopathology is used as a standard of truth. Thank, uh, thank you so much for that. Um, Dr. Fetzer, could you weigh in um, on this question also? Uh, thank you. You know, it has been shown that in hepatitis C population who have uh, achieved uh, SVR, that the uh, stiffness post-treatment uh, dramatically decreases faster than we would expect the fibrosis to be resolving. So we do knew, know that uh, inflammation contributes to liver stiffness. Uh, I do agree with Dr. Eamon that it's likely uh, less of a contributing factor than the underlying fibrosis, but uh, there there is some confounder there, but some collinearity. You know, um, again, I think this um, alludes to one of my concerns is that we're trying to um, ha ask one imaging biomarker to answer multiple questions. And we, we really need a multi-parametric approach to ensure that we are answering the appropriate question in the appropriate context of use. So uh, I, I will uh, admit that inflammation and fibrosis will both impact liver stiffness, which will impact both shear wave elastography by um, diagnostic ultrasound or by VCTE and likely by uh, MRE as well. Um, but again, we need a multi-parametric uh, uh, approach to answer these uh, variety of questions. Excellent, excellent, thank you so much. Um, and now finally, uh, Dr. Banerjee, please provide um, your input to this. Thank you, Abbas, a good question. Um, I don't think you can purely dissociate inflammation from fibrosis in NASH because the two coexist. Um, you know, it's that, 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 and especially in the target population that we're looking at here, NASH with advanced fibrosis, the two coexist. Um, there are blood biomarkers that may be better suited to do this. You know, Nordic Biosciences have a portfolio, ELF, and so on and so forth. Corrected T1 is a great biomarker for pure inflammation. 
in the context of, for example, patients with autoimmune hepatitis, and that's been published in several papers in the BMJ and otherwise, that actually it's almost like a virtual biopsy for those patients. And you can monitor and uh, titrate doses of immunosuppression in patients with inflammatory autoimmune hepatitis. In hep C, we've seen that a 100 millisecond drop in corrected T1 corresponds with SVR, and that was Jayaswal et al. Um, and uh, I think there are publications to that tune as well, and that's a sort of more fibrotic condition with a lower level of inflammation. We've also seen in hep C that patients with cirrhosis take much longer to resolve their corrected T1 than patients with non-cirrhotic hep C. That's a learning that we can pull into NASH. So um, we may not be able to dissociate them, but we are able to infer from the clinical picture which one is being treated. And depending on the condition, we probably want to treat both. If you use rheumatoid arthritis as an example, um, we don't really treat depending on a resolution of fibrosis or a resolution of inflammation, you look for no disease activity. You, know, you have disease modifying agents and you use them to reduce disease activity to nil or near nil, for example, a CRP of less than eight. Um, so I think we can do a lot better than what we currently have using imaging. Great, thank you. Um, next, uh, Dr. Fournier, please, uh, I see your hand up. Please uh, go ahead and uh, respond. Yes, thank you. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to allude to some of the data from the study we did with Professor Newsom. Uh, actually, uh, in uh, the study that he presented with more than uh, 370 patients where liver biopsy was read very carefully by two pathologists uh, with consensus and biopsy were done very closely to, to fibroscan, we indeed showed that in univariate analysis, liver stiffness was associated with all the histological parameters, fibrosis, ballooning, lobular inflammation, portal inflammation, and steatosis. But then when you do a multivariate uh, analysis, only liver stiffness is only uh, sorry, fibrosis is influencing uh, liver stiffness. And similar results were also uh, shown from the data set from the NASH CRN. Now, getting back to what uh, Benji was saying, uh, the question is, do we really need to disentangle uh, inflammation from, from fibrosis? Because if liver stiffness is linked to clinical outcome, uh, be directionally, uh, then that may be good enough. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Serlin, you're next. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, I was going to uh, pretty much say the same thing, just to be a little bit provocative. Who cares whether stiffness is really or corrected T1 or whatever the biomarker is, who cares whether it's primarily looking at fibrosis or whether it's looking at some combination of fibrosis and inflammation. If the biomarker goes down and the decrease is sustained, and I want to emphasize that because that's something I learned yesterday, that we need to show that it is sustained so that we can show that it links to clinical benefit. But if it is a sustained decrease, who cares? whether it's only fibrosis or whether it's fibrosis and inflammation they're decreasing. I'm purposely trying to be a little bit provocative. It's possible the FDA has a more nuanced look at this, but uh, I would just say practically, who cares? Go ahead, Dr. Newsom, and then I'll, re I'll respond a little bit to Dr. Selene's question. Yeah, no, hi. I mean, I think Selene's made the point. So when we looked at this in the, the prospective study, there was a fairly there was a non-significant contribution of steatosis or inflammation to the fibrosis signal. And I think I mean, there's, there's two points. You know, One is the one that's just been raised, does it matter or not? I mean, I think the first point is it doesn't seem to influence the interpretation of fibrosis. But I think the question then is, when does it matter or not? Well, I think it depends on what you're trying to do. I think if you're trying to determine prognosis, then you know, I accept that. But if you're saying... I want to understand what the effect of intervention X has been on fat inflammation and fibrosis. Those occur in temporally different fashions, and therefore understanding which bits are changing, I think is telling you something about what's happening, you know, with the patient in question. Well, thanks for the comment. So I guess in response to Dr. So in, um, there's one line of thinking where 
maybe you, you don't care as much about the mechanisms if your prediction is extremely strong um, in terms of the clinical outcome or disease stability or disease response, you might uh, be able to accept some uncertainty about the mechanism. But there's another line of thinking that, especially in the context of drug development, understanding the mechanism um, that you're observing and kind of what the biomarker is actually measuring and how that links to biology and pathophysiology helps you understand kind of which drug, the drug mechanism of action. And if the drug mechanism of action is achieving what you want. So if you had a kind of, uh, this, if the mechanism of action of the drug was in one domain and you're observing the change in a biomarker in a different domain, then you may you know, start to ask more questions about what's actually going on. And it may have you uh, just, just think a little harder about, do I really understand how this drug is working? Is it doing what I think it's doing? So that's kind of in just um, some benefit, but I can also see sometimes you can live with un uncertainty of the mechanism. So go ahead and respond. Yeah, I, first of all, I was, I was purposely trying to be a little bit simplistic and a little bit provocative. So I just wanted to say that uh, I meant in the context of using a biomarker to assess treatment response with the hope that someday it might be a surrogate you know, or a reasonably likely surrogate endpoint. Clearly for mechanistic studies, we can't be so glib and say, who cares what the mechanism is? The whole purpose is to understand the mechanism. The thing about, uh, I'll focus on stiffness for a second. Stiffness clearly is not measuring fibrosis per se, it's measuring stiffness. And stiffness is, what the, many things contribute to stiffness, but in metabolic associated fatty liver disease, the, the number one, predominant thing is, in fact, uh, fibrosis. Um, the other thing I'd like to point out, though, is that fibrosis is itself also a multi-parametric thing. The histologist doesn't just look at the amount of collagen. They look at the type of collagen, the location of the collagen, the shape of the collagen. So, so even something that histologically is thought to be one variable is actually a composite and I'm not a pathologist, and, and maybe they're cringing when they hear me say this, but fibrosis is also not a single variable. It's also a multivariable uh, sort of composite assessment. Thanks so much. Uh, Dr. Dodd. Yeah, I, I was just going to follow up on your comment about having not understanding the mechanism and having some sort you know, with example of inflammation and fibrosis. I mean, from the perspective of a surrogate endpoint, I mean, if you're that that's true, right? If if you're convinced that the intervention, the effect of the intervention as measured by the biomarker, whether that captures inflammation and fibrosis or what what have you, as long as that effect capture on the biomarker captures the treatment effect estimate on the clinical outcome, I think you're good. But in the absence of those data, I think you're obliged to really better understand the mechanisms behind it and follow a different path, thanks. All right, thanks to the panel. We're gonna move on to uh, Dr. Banerjee. Did you wanna respond before we move to the next question or go ahead? You're muted. On the inflammation thing, one area where imaging can help, and there's a reference for this, Wei Hei Wong et al. in the New England Journal of Medicine. If you do large population studies with imaging, we can pick up the causes of inflammation. So in that case, they determined that clonal hematopoiesis was a cause of liver inflammation with no increase in liver fat. Now, our role as imagers or providers of imaging in this field is partly with the surrogate endpoint and the diagnostic enrichment endpoints that we need to develop. And that's work we need to do. But on the mechanistic side, and this is going back to the point Laurie just made, we can help with some of it, even if we can't provide all of the answers. So I'm not the, I'm not the person to tell you about CHIP, but I may be the person to tell you that CHIP makes liver disease worse. And then one other uh, point that I wanted to make that's relevant is Corrected T1 actually has an accepted biomarker qualification package with the FDA, but only in the context of use of diagnostic enrichment. What this means is it's we're, we're on the process. So the community is getting there. My point is, can we all just get there a little bit faster with the view of the demand for the knowledge as to whether these drugs 
work or not looming behind us? Thanks for all the comments. We're going to move on to the next question. Um, and maybe I'm asking the, the cheerleading squad for radiological imaging to provide this answer. So, so just, uh, I understand, <laughs> but can we have the panel discuss a little bit about the benefits and limitations of uh, including these various modalities in the context of clinical trials. Um, and in particular, um, I didn't hear too many comments on it, but could the panel discuss uh, maybe modality specific uh, where the results of the imaging exam either could not be achieved or couldn't be trusted or something. So I'm thinking of kind of, you know, you, you just couldn't get a reliable result from the exam. And, you know, could you just comment on the kind of exclusion of those patients from the radiological imaging domain? Any volunteer to go first? Go ahead, Dr. Reeder. Well, I can comment just a little bit on uh, MRI in, in general. Um, for the most part, uh, the majority of the modalities, MRE elastography, PDFF, CT1, uh, these are all generally technically feasible in the vast majority of patients. And a lot of these patients, of course, um, I have, uh, you know, a high BMI. And, uh, you know, historically, that was a challenge for uh, MRI. The good news is that the modern systems are 70 and even 80 centimeter bore sizes with uh, table limits of 500 to 700 plus pounds now. So I think that limitation has generally diminished. And in my experience with clinical trials, uh, failure for, for that reason happens, but rarely. Uh, there are other, you know, contraindications, uh, occasionally claustrophobia, less so with the larger bore magnets and, and things like metal. So I would say for the, for the, uh, for the most part, uh, technical success of MRI is high. Uh, I think the bigger issue, and I'm, uh, is that is really one of access. Um, there are, um, you know, uh, MRI systems at most major medical centers, uh, certainly in, um, uh, you know, so the so-called global north in the United States, but, uh, maybe in some communities or in some countries, access uh, may be problematic, which is why I think that the point that Dr. Fetzer made earlier about access with MRI, or pardon me, with ultrasound, uh, as well as uh, some newer technologies that are on the horizon for point of care NMR techniques, I think are going to make a huge difference uh, in these settings. Oh, thank you. Dr. Fetzer. Thanks. I think the literature suggest, uh, shows that uh, MR elastography is probably uh, more reproducible um, and with a lower failure rate than the ultrasound-based techniques. Um, but I still, in my experience and in the literature I've read on ultrasound-based cheery of elastography, the failure rate is uh, less than 8%, I think, in our institution, even with a large patient population, about 5%. Uh, one of the important things about ultrasound is that you can perform it multiple times. Uh, you have more uh, bandwidth as far as a, a, uh, accommodating more patients and being able to image them more often. Um, so I think those are benefits that have to be balanced with the cost and access uh, that Dr. Reeder was uh, uh, mentioning as well. So, um, you know, admittedly, we, we do ultrasound in general struggles with the patient population we're talking about today, the, the obese with the, the fatty livers. Um, but I think with uh, efforts from say uh, Kiva and AIUM and SRU organizations that focus on high quality ultrasound and, and publishing uh, recommendations for, for technical um, uh, excellence uh, have homogenized a lot of the heterogeneity that was first discussed between manufacturers and Shariva elastography um, and a lot of, and uh, with the, the latest guidelines, technical recommendations, I think that, that uh, variability between uh, manufacturers and the failure rate have, have both gone down. So I think we're in a much better space today with ultrasound-based tree of elastography uh, than we were, say, uh, 10 years ago. So I, I, it holds great promise. I think there's emerging literature to show that the various techniques that we discussed today, especially for liver stiffness, perform uh, very well uh, with reasonably low uh, failure rates. Thanks. I think, uh, Dr. Sterling, you're next. You're on mute. Uh, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, again, I'm going to be a little bit provocative here. I think from the MRI perspective, MRE perspective, the single biggest uh, impediment uh, or barrier in clinical trials, I would argue, is the financial charge 
that is levied for MRI and MRE. Uh, I am a member of Nimble, and as we're working on stage two, it has come to my attention that uh, in clinical trials, a 30-minute non-contrast MRI exam can can be charged as much as $3,000 for a 30-minute non-contrast exam. Now, as a, you would think, as a radiologist, I'd be aware of this, but I was not aware of this until recently. Radiologists typically are not the ones who are uh, creating these price tags. But I think the $3,000 price tag for a 30-minute non-contrast MRI is the single biggest impediment to the use of MRI in clinical trials. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Fournier, who's next? Yes, thank you. So I would like to uh, yeah, to abandon what uh, Dr. Fetzer mentioned. I mean, yes, uh, ultrasound-based uh, techniques uh, have uh, limitation in morbid obesity, but uh, elastography technique and VCT has been shown to have a relatively low, less than even 5 or 3% uh, failure rate in patients with NAFLD, including in the USA. That was shown by the, the Indonesia and data set, for example. Um, it is important also to remember that to get reliable measurements, the right probe needs to be used on the right uh, patients. So we have different probes adapted to the morphology of the patients and that you need to follow the recommendation from the, so from the device to make sure that you, you get a robust reading. And uh, it is important also to pay attention to the fact that the patient should be fasting, that because of hemodynamic thing, uh, conditions, uh, the patient also probably needs to rest at least five minutes before starting the procedure. So all these things are things that needs to be controlled, especially in trials to, to, to improve the robustness of the measurements. Thank you. Dr. Eamon. Well, thank you. I guess I'd like to comment on the, the topic of uh, access and cost as it relates to particularly to MRI-based procedures and specifically MRE. Um, <clears throat> this issue of uh, access and, um, has, has been something that's been written about a lot. And I think at this point now, there are about 1,300 locations around the U.S. that have, uh, they're equipped for MRE. So, you know, access is not, um, uh, is not necessarily uh, limited. Uh, and there's about 2,300 uh, places around the world that have the technology um, so th I think that's an important thing. And now, now as far as costs go, um, I think uh, Dr. Serlin has a very good point that, and it's probably something that's a kind of um, a negative about the radiology uh, community, perhaps in the U.S., in that uh, there are very, very high rates sometimes charged for MRI exams, uh, what the market will bear in certain places, and particularly that's true in clinical trials. So uh, at an academic institution to have a, an abdominal MRI may cost thousands of dollars. But I think the proper, uh, the appropriate reference for the costs of these things uh, is the CMS uh, assigned cost for these particular exams. And they're surprisingly low. And so it's really a matter of negotiation uh, rather than what the, what the, what the, uh, uh, what people think the cost might be. So for instance, that, non-contrast abdominal MRI exam, uh, which may not include MRE, is on the order of $400 through Medicare in the US, right? And that, and there's an unusual thing that happened uh, in the MRE area in that the radiology community came together and said to the ACR, we want the charge for this to be as low as possible. So in fact, in 2022, the average charge for an MRE in the US was $178. Uh, through the CMS, through the government pay situation. So it's true that if you go to a private uh, hospital uh, or an academic medical center that'll charge what the market will bear, uh, you may charge a whole lot more. But I think the reference point for these 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 costs should be the CMS uh, assigned cost, which is, I think, the way we can compare costs between modalities, because all modalities are marked up by by academic medical centers and in the context of clinical trials. So that I just thought those points were important. Thanks so much. And Dr. Reeder, in the interest of time, I'm going to move to the next question, if that's okay with you. I, and before, I would wanted to ask Dr. Dodd, could you comment a little bit about um, missing data in the context of clinical trials, and in particular, uh, discuss the intent to treat population and generalizability of results? Thank you. 
Yeah, um, and I guess th there's a couple aspects to this. Are, are you referring to um, sort of missing baseline data? Or are you referring to missing data of uh, a biomarker endpoint that might be used as a outcome endpoint? Well, I think as we just heard from some of the panel, although um, there's benefits in terms of accessibility in terms of ultrasound, but there is a subset of the population where um, it is difficult to get results at all um, due to the obesity issue. And I was just wondering if you could comment that on that in the context of clinical trials. Yeah, so I'm, I mean, I, I think one has to really make sure that whatever biomarker um, is being utilized is going to have a broad applicability without risk of missing data in whatever population is of interest, right? So if if you're trying to, to, to study a population that is not going to um, be able to be measurable by your biomarker, then I think you have to, to find a different biomarker for that population. But I think you have to... To, to, to match the population that you're trying to study um, with the biomarker um, and the intervention that you're trying to utilize so that you have generalizable results. Well, thank you very much. Abbas, do you wanna ask the next question? Yes, yes, thank you so much. Um, so this question is based for the VCT even. If a patient had a VCT score of 15 kilopascals in 2021, before treatment, and then that VCT score decreased to 10 kilopascals uh, a year later in 2022 after treatment, does this give the same magnitude of benefit as when the same patient had a reading of 10 kilopascals in 2013? So like, yeah, in 2013, like uh, a few, like five or six years later. So Dr. Fournier, could you uh, provide your um, input? Yes, so we, we've heard yesterday that uh, in the example of HCV, uh, uh, 8 kilopascal before treatment uh, was not necessarily having the same meaning uh, after treatment. Now here um, in, uh, in NAFLD NASH, um, we, we have uh, probably a, a different situation because treatment will continue. So it's not so much about what happened after treatment, but what happens under treatment. And we don't have uh, this information yet, and we need trials to be completed with clinical outcome. That being said, uh, in a natural history uh, cohort, such as uh, the NASH CRN, uh, it has been shown uh, that when liver stiffness uh, increase from non-cirrhosis to cirrhosis, uh, using a predefined cutoff to, 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 to assess what is not cirrhosis and cirrhosis, uh, you have, uh, when patients progress from non-cirrhosis to cirrhosis, uh, compared to non-progressor, they have a seven-fold increase uh, in the risk of clinical outcome. And that was presented at ASLD last year, uh, and uh, Phil presented that. Uh, and what they have shown also in the paper, which is currently under review, is that the regression uh, also works uh, by reducing the risk, meaning that if you are cirrhotic and you regress below uh, 12 kilopascal, you have a 75% decrease in your risk of clinical event. So there is a bidirectional link between the engine liver stiffness over time and clinical outcome and the risk of clinical outcome. Very great. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Fetzer, Dr. Newsom, um, would you like to weigh into this? I'll just um, say that I think that the data is still emerging. Uh, we know that liver stiffness and the amount of fibrosis is a, a nonlinear relationship. Um, so uh, I think uh, more outcomes data uh, is needed. Um, but to, you know, again, we're, we're re referencing these stiffness values to an imperfect reference standard, which is uh, 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 stage, right? Which we have all now discussed at, at nauseum is a heterogeneous evaluation with a lot of heterogeneity within each stage. So um, I think utilizing that continuous scale is important, but you allude to what is the cutoff that's going to be meaningful? What is the, the delta between two measurements uh, that gives us a reproducible and meaningful uh, outcomes data? And, and I think that's where a lot of research, whether it's from uh, ultrasound-based or MRI-based techniques, uh, is, is still needed. Well, thanks for your comments. So I'm sorry. I think Dr. Newsom was um, about to oh, say. Sorry. Yeah, no, I would echo the comments by um, Celine and David. 
I think the other point, I guess, is it also depends where in the range that change is taking place. So I think in here, you know, the range, you know, is sort of 10 to 15. So, you know, you saw from some of the data I presented that 16 to 20 seems to be the group that is at that higher risk. Um, and in answer to the first question, I mean, that we, we're developing an understanding, but there's clearly still a lot more to learn around, you know, if you go from 10 to 15 and come back to 10, is that the same place as you started? And we don't really know the answer to that question yet. Oh, great comment there. So the so next question, we've heard some discussion of kind of repeatability and reproducibility of the various techniques, and they all have some uncertainty associated with them. And I always like to think of uncertainty in the context of the magnitude of change you're looking for. So if you have a really big change, you can tolerate a lot of uncertainty. And if you're looking for a small change, uh, you need a really good measurement. So, you know, we've had some discussion and comparison against uh, histopathology um, scales, but I, I was wondering if we could ask the panel to weigh in on, you know, what magnitude of change might be considered um, kind of a meaningful clinical benefit or reasonably likely to predict a clinically meaningful and if it, and we don't and if we don't know how how can we find out uh, go ahead uh, dr banerjee thanks uh, dan so i think we've done quite a lot of work on this um, and the mri community benefits from this cuz we just love measuring stuff so if you look at the guidance from cms uh, and other payers there are some fairly clear thresholds that are scientifically based and that fold into what we predict to be um, how we'll form pathways to treat people with NASH or MAFLD or whatever it's called. If you've got a corrected T1 below 800 milliseconds, you're fine. Um, if it's slightly lower, you have slightly less cardiovascular risk, but you know, I, I tend to sit around 790, so I don't want to push that comment. Mm -hmm. If you have a corrected T1 greater than 840 milliseconds, you're more likely to develop clinical outcomes. And when that was redone, it was 825. So they're both quite close together. And um, the payers consider someone with a corrected T1 greater than 875 milliseconds to be someone with at-risk NASH. So essentially two times uh, the coefficient of variance, similar to the data that um, Scott showed in his talk. <laughs> now, the nice thing is corrected T1 as a linear association with disease activity, whereas PDFF does not. So uh, the reason PDFF does not predict clinical outcomes is that patients with cirrhosis often have low fat. That's why we call it in the clinical non-academic domain, cryptogenic uh, cirrhosis, or we suspected this person had NASH, but now it's burnt out and we can't see any fat. So with corrected T1, the magnitude of change that we're really looking for, and we've seen this in many trials, is around um, 80 milliseconds difference. So if you start out at greater than 875 and you come to less than 800, that is a meaningful difference that we think associates with NASH resolution. And there's a couple of papers to that effect. Habas, I've sent them to you. I'm very happy for you to distribute them. Thank you very much. Dr. Reeder. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, uh, just commenting a little bit about PDFF, uh, since I focused on that. I mean, I think one of the challenges of PDFF, of course, is that it's really the initial uh, problem with the whole spectrum of fatty liver disease. And, you know, it's the sort of initial and hallmark feature. And so, you know, considering that it can take decades to, you know, develop into cirrhosis and all of the complications, uh, it's no surprise that um, the data, there are limited data on PDFF um, predicting outcomes. And frankly, I don't know that we should really even be trying because I think it'll be difficult uh, to uh, to get there. Um, and but, you know, what's interesting to me, and I think the question I would ask of hepatologists and pathologists is it does predict cha changes in PDFF do predict changes in the histology, including inflammation and fibrosis. And so in a sense, uh, it's helpful, and I think that everybody believes that if you lose weight, for example, or on semaglutide, and that your PDFF goes down, that that's probably a good thing. Uh, so I, I'm just not sure that we really need to go there. But the, it, but the challenge is going to be that as we really think about how do we treat 100 million people with with um, uh, fatty liver disease, that we really want to be pushing the biomarkers and the disease process earlier and earlier, and the earliest biomarker is PDFF. So I think we're going to get have to get our heads wrapped around and be comfortable with the idea that a change in liver fat 
is actually a good thing. Now, the, only, the one comment I would also respond to Banjo is that it's really not a diagnostic dilemma when patients have cirrhosis. That's an easy thing to do. So I do agree with the point that PDFF doesn't correspond to outcomes, but that's really the wrong patient population. The patient population that we really care about is when we're not at the cirrhotic stage. Because yes, PDFF does drop in cirrhosis, but we have other ways of knowing they have cirrhosis. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Eman, if you could comment a little bit about kind of the magnitude of change and what might be considered kind of a, a meaningful magnitude of change in the context of MRE elastography. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and I'll be very brief. Uh, so, you know, from a biophysical standpoint, um, the shear modulus, which we measure with either ultrasound elastography or, or MR elastography, it's a very plausible mecha mechanistic physical connection to the severity of liver fibrosis. Now it's complex, but it's there. And uh, as, but as you know, the increments in stiffness between histologic stages of fibrosis are small at the low end and they grow larger with progressive stages. So in large uh, NASH cohorts, the difference between mean stiffness values of patients with F2 and F3 and F, between, uh, 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 between F2 and F3 and F3 and F4 fibrosis, the differences are about one kilopascal. So, the and actually the difference on, in these large cohorts between F1 and F2 is about 0.8 kilopascal. Now, the relationship between uh, stiffness and fibrosis stage, which again, we're, we're, we're stuck with having to deal with that right now, uh, that's a nonlinear relationship. So with larger steps as you get to higher stages of fibrosis. So um, in that meta-analysis of uh, 798 MAFLD patients, uh, the steps in mean stiffness from F1 to F2 and from F2 to F3 and from F3 to F4 are each about 30% increases in stiffness. So for that reason, I think we're better off using a percentage change as an endpoint rather than an absolute uh, uh, stiffness, uh, stiffness value because it's about 30% in each of those, uh, those steps. And going in the other direction, the step sizes that would represent regression from F4 to F3 or F3 to F2 or F2 to F1 are all about almost exactly 24% decreases in stiffness. Now, there's nothing magical necessarily about a fibrosis stage, but if we're talking about a meaningful change, a 24% decrease in stiffness, I would suggest is a meaningful change. And the last thing I'll say is that, and as you know, the uh, Quantitative Imaging Biomarkers Alliance has said that if you have a change of greater than 19%, then that has a 95% likelihood of being a real biological change. So I'll just stop there. And Claude may have more to say about this. Yeah, thank you very much. Go ahead, Dr. Sarlin. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dick. Um, I'm, I, I agree with everything Dick said, but now I'd like to try to answer the same question using the concepts that I learned yesterday, um, which I thought were extremely valuable. So the question is, what magnitude of change may be considered as a reasonably likely surrogate endpoint? Um, and we learned that uh, a clinical benefit is something that improves how a patient functions, feels, or survives. Clearly, the stiffness of the liver does not directly affect how a patient feels because patients who have stiff livers don't necessarily know they have stiff livers doesn't necessarily assess how they function unless they get to extreme severities and doesn't uh, directly assess how they survive either. So what we need to try to find out is, and I want to try to de-link MRE from fibrosis because that paradigm, I think, is flawed. I am not sure we'll ever be able to show, I'm trying to be a little provocative here, I'm not sure we'll ever be able to show that MRE can assess treatment response if we're linking it to biopsy because of the spatial variability of biopsy at baseline and then the treatment. So can we link MRE to clinical benefit? And in order to do that, we would need to design a study in which the patients have stiff enough livers at baseline that left alone, there's a risk that they would actually progress to cirrhosis and decompensation. We would need to find a treatment that actually works, and that's a big if, so that there will actually be some patients whose liver stiffness goes down. In that context, we may be able to figure out a magnitude of stiffness reduction that if sustained, does in fact prevent the progression to cirrhosis and to other complications such as hepatic decompensation. I think it's gonna be extremely difficult to do this. 
I think it's going to require a lot of stakeholders coming together to design trials. It may require the pooling of data across multiple trials. So I'll stop now, but the key point I'd like to make is I don't think it's known what the magnitude is trying to use the threshold of what would be a clinically beneficial uh, change. Thanks so much for your comments, Dr. Sterling. And I just wanted to um, acknowledge our appreciation for focusing on the challenge of relating these radiological imaging biomarkers to clinically meaningful endpoints and kind of taking the question independent from what the histopathology or maybe in parallel, but not necessarily anchoring the radiological imaging to the histopathology. So go ahead, Dr. Dodd. I'm sure you have some good comments. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I was just going to comment that I think it's not just a question of magnitude, but it's a question about the durability of the response, right? Rather than a temporary improvement, it's possible that a therapeutic intervention may cause transient improvements in these biomarkers that don't affect the, the patient outcome. So just wanted to add the magnitude and the durability or, you know, some duration of, of that response that is thought to correlate or you know, thought to translate to clinical patient outcome benefits. Can I ask a quick follow-up on that? I think um, following up on Dr. Sterling's comments, in my understanding, in a lot of this population, we're, we're talking about sort of a future risk of disease progression. So it's really like a, a prognostic marker of how likely a patient may be or a collection of patients may be to develop kind of a more severe disease in the future. And in that context, I was just wondering if you could respond and how you might think about kind of durability um, when we're thinking about kind of a probabilistic risk. Um, that's a great question. Um, you know, and I think I think one has to though understand um, how sustainable those responses are, right? And if a, if a patient's bouncing up and down, then surely that means something different from having a patient who who responds and goes below some threshold. Um, and you know, unfortunately, though, whenever you're in the scenario where you're trying to predict risk of future events, you're in a scenario where there are large trials, right? usually the risk is relatively low and you're probably modifying the risk by small amounts, um, which can translate into large trials. Um, but I think that's a really, um, I, I, that's a great topic worth further discussion. Thanks. Dr. Fournier, you had a comment. So I just want to get back to what Dr. Heyman mentioned. So I completely agree with what he said on the fact that Moving from F2 to F3 and from F3 to F4 does not imply the same accumulate the same amount of fibrosis which is accumulated, and that we see that also with liver stiffness, which indeed is not linearly linked to fibrosis stage. So I do also agree that uh, it would be more relevant to use a relative change uh, in in liver stiffness to assess a meaningful change, uh, and so. Uh, Part of the answer may also come from, from a um, natural history cohort. Uh, there will be also data at the upcoming ASLD from a, a large data set, a global data set uh, of more than 10,000 patients with repeat fibro scan over time and, and clinical outcome. And um, these data are showing that uh, in patients with intermediate or high risk of uh, advanced liver disease at baseline, then a 20% uh, change, uh, alors, regression, stable, or progression is linked to uh, an increased uh, risk of clinical outcome. So that might already be a, a starting point. Thank you. Lost my mouse for a second. Dr. Banerjee. Thanks, Dan. Um... So I just want to address, um, I think it was um, Dr. Dodd's point about um, robustness. We are able to do these big trials. So, you know, we've done liver multi-scan now in, in UK Biobank in over 60,000 people. And we are able to show that the PDFF and CT1 results are very, very stable over two years in a big number of people. And we're able to show also that there are, you know, if there is a change, we know the thresholds for meaningful change. More than 40 seconds is a real change. More than 80 seconds, we think, is a clinically meaningful change. 
Some advice that would be helpful for us from the agency is we don't want to be too dependent on UK biobanks. So we have to have multiple sources of data, including other people's clinical trials, other prospective trials, et cetera. Um, but also, I think Litmus and definitely Nimble have done repeatability and reproducibility studies. I don't know if Arun's going to present that data in a second, but we know which biomarkers perform very well, and we know which biomarkers we can then sort of hand over to you and the, the maths team rather than the medical team, because when medics do stats, it's usually not so great. So I do want to ask for a synergy there, but with some speed. Um, so that we know what you want from us to create a surrogate endpoint, knowing what we know about stability, reproducibility, uh, repeatability in the same kind of patients and in different kind of patients. And that's one of the reasons that corrected T1 is standardized across scanners and field strengths, which was one of the points that I think Dr. Rita made, that T1 is a difficult biomarker because it depends on scanner and field strengths. So we've tried to standardize it. I think you used the phrase harmonization when it was with PET, you know, how do you, how do you make it deliverable? I'm not saying it's perfect, but it's out there. But some guidance from you as to how to translate that faster would be really helpful. I'll leave that to others. <laughs> In the future sessions, probably today and in the future as well. Uh, Dr. Serlin, go ahead. Um, I was about to talk about um, the evidence for MRE and prognosis, but looking at the chat messages, I see that maybe this is a question that is should be directed to Dr. Eman. So may, maybe I'll turn it back over uh, uh, to Abbas, and I'll take my hand down. Oh, uh, thank you, Dr. Serlin. Um, yeah, so I uh, just wanted to ask, what current level of evidence is available as to how MRE or VCT predict clinical outcomes. And I just, uh, would like to uh, ask Dr. Amen and Dr. Newsom to weigh in on this question. Thank you. But of course, Dr. Lin, uh, you can respond um, too. <laughs> but let, let, let Dr. Amen, please go first. Yes, Dr. Amen. Well, thank you. I, I think that uh, uh, Dr. Serlin actually identified that there were multiple studies that have been done that really have uh, related um, uh, outcomes, uh, clinical outcomes to uh, 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 baseline measurements of liver stiffness made with MRE. Uh, one in particular, uh, for instance, showed that uh, if you have um, a, a, a cirrhosis and you have a baseline uh, stiffness of uh, of uh, five kilopascals at the time at the at the time of diagnosis, then at three years you have a twenty percent chance of decompensation or death. And if, on the other hand, your baseline stiffness value at at the time of diagnosis is eight kilopascals, uh, then at three year at the three year mark you have a forty percent chance of decompensation or death. So there are multiple studies like that that have shown the relationship between baseline liver stiffness as measured with MRE, and I, I'm sure also that's true for ultrasound as well, that, and subsequent clinical course. Uh, and I won't go any further than that. I think that's a, just a, there's a large literature now on that. Thanks so much. Uh, Dr. Newsom, if you could comment a little bit to, about this in the yeah, context no, no, of sure. last time. It's an important question, and I, I touched on it in my presentation. I think in totality, there's probably about two and a half to 3,000 plus patients for whom we have data on prognosis and the link with um, LSM from VCT. And as I indicated in my, my slide, I think, you know, once you start to get, well, I mean, the, the studies are looking at various different cutoffs, whether it's, you know, above 10, below 10, et cetera, et cetera. But certainly once you get north of 16 to 20 kilopascals, there's a very sort of, you know, marked separation in the curves in terms of prognosis. So I think, I think there's data there. I think, I think, I guess where it starts to become, uh, the next level question is, you know, how you how you individualize that conversation, and I guess that's that's they're going to be the same with all of the biomarkers. You can put them in a broad, increased category group, but you don't necessarily know which one of those individuals would be the one that that has that outcome. Well, I don't know, Celine, if you want to comment on that. No, no, yeah. Um, again, I mean, there are coming data from the national end, from this large cohort that I mentioned to confirm that, but yes, there is already a large data set from Litmus and individual patient data meta analysis, which confirm this, this link. Yeah. Right. And Dr. Sterling, you're close to the last word, I think. So 
Go ahead. No, I'm sorry about that. I, I just wanted to emphasize again that there really is a lot of emerging data that MRE stiffness has prognostic classification uh, abilities. Even in the subset of patients with cirrhosis, MRE can stratify the risk. What is not known, though, it's very plausible, but what has not been proven is if someone's stiffness decreases, whether spontaneously, whether by treatment, whether by weight loss, whatever it is, it is very plausible to assume that the patient now will have the risk associated, the lower risk associated with lower stiffness, but that has not been proven. So we really need that research to show that a decrease in liver stiffness, if sustained, will lead to a decrease in risk. And that data does not exist, to my knowledge. It's upcoming, at least with VCT, hopefully. So. All right, Dr. Todd, we'll give you the last comment, and then I'll hand it off to Abbas to wrap up. I just want to add one more point that I that is a critical step, right? What what Claude just mentioned, but we to, to use this as a surrogate, it needs to go beyond that, right? So that so that it's proven that a change in the biomarker between but in in a clinical trial, you're evaluating drug A versus some comparator arm. Let's call it B. You need to be convinced that the that clinical that change in the biomarker. Between those two arms, that estimate of the effect on the biomarker predicts the effect on the clinical outcome, right? So it's not just enough to prove that it's, you know, predictive of clinical outcome. Thanks. I think you'll have the last word, and uh, we're actually at time. So go, but please go ahead and try your input. You know, I, I completely agree with Laurie. I mean, I guess I presented some data that talk about a change in the biomarker which then changes the outcome. And I think your point is above and beyond that, which is, does that hold true with an intervention for therapy? And I guess the answer is we'll get those data from the large phase threes. Thank you. All right, well, uh, I'd like to thank um, all the panelists, uh, speakers and panelists for presenting and providing uh, great data and information on these imaging and ITs. Um, we look forward to uh, having uh, two more good sessions um, and we'll be back at 1225. Thank you so much.